We are going to start with the opening session of the conference in which well, this project is led by the Foundation and there's the participation of the Foundation Pablo Iglesias, Dusty VC, the research group Photodoc and the CCIL. I would like to invite everyone who is following us through streaming so that they can share with us their comments on the social media through the hashtag that is in the, on screen and is 1939 Aerial Terror in English. And without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to the Dean of the Faculty of Science of Documentation. Mr. Gonzalo, thank you very much. Thank you, Director and Secretary of State and President of the Foundation Pablo Iglesias. Thank you to the Faculty of Science of the Documentation, those who are here face to face, but also those who are following us through the social media or remotely through the channel that has been prepared by the organizers of this international conference. My role as Dean of the Faculty of Science of the Doc Documentation Sciences is just to welcome you all to our home and also to give you all, to thank you all. First of all, I would like to thank the Foundation, uh, to the Foundation Public Iglesias and the other foundations for having organized this uh, conference, also to the Italian Foundation and to all the people that have participated and are sponsoring this international conference that I think is of great importance and of great currency. I would also like to thank and congratulate me because this is not the first time that the foundation uh, and the uh, faculty participate through a group of, uh, through a research group. Uh, Sanchez Vigil, it's been several years, four, I think about four years since we've been coordinated both the foundation and the documentation service and, our, and us, we have collaborated closely. I would like to say that that close collaboration would come to a climax today with the conference, but that would mean that would close down a collaboration that I don't think is coming to an end. We'll continue to work and uh, go up. So welcome. Thank you. Congratulations, first of all, because the program is without a doubt uh, fantastic. And I think that there are speakers of international and national relevance that will make this conference a clear milestone as is going to be explained by the people who are uh, here with me that have a greater understanding than me. But given that we are in the documentation science faculty, I couldn't resist to look, to look in the documentation. And I found it quite interesting. It's called 1939 Spain Export Aerial Terror to Europe. But as we know, aerial bombardments are not anything new. In the Civil War, they took place. But it's interesting that in the Spanish press, in 1912, in the Atalaya newspaper in um, Santander, there was this item, this news item from a French uh, newspaper called uh, Down Goes the Bomb. And it said that the Germans have, just in case they're going to fight with uh, France in 1912, that is, they are have a new and formidable plan, is to bomb uh, France through the airspace with aircrafts that would uh, drop 10,000 kilograms of dynamite and therefore that would uh, in fact be seen from the uh, from the Belgian border and uh, what the journalist from Santander said is given the current situation of aircraft that aerial bombardment is as easy as blocking the moon with by an English squadron. At the time, it seemed like a joke in 1936-39 until 1945. Well, it seemed like a joke in 1912, scientific, uh, science fiction, we could say, became a drama for those who suffered the bombardments during the two large war conflicts, the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War. 
And with this remembrance of this uh, journalist from Santander in 1912, I'll give the floor to Jose Maria so that he continues with the opening ceremony. Thank you. I now give the floor to Anastasio de Gracias Foundation, Pedro Rojas, uh, the chairman of that foundation. <laughs> I'm not vaccinated, but I've got antibodies, though. Bueno, buenos días. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to say hello to all of you, uh, all of you who are here in this opening session. Secretary of State, thank you very much. Dear Dean Alfredo, Chairman of the Foundation Paula Iglesias, and to all of you who have collaborated with us, who are collaborating with us, who are part of this program, of this event, those who are following us through streaming, in the different organizations that collaborate with our foundation to carry out this project. Thank you very much for your support and uh, my regards to all of you. You know that we are in an academic uh, event, which is the core issue from the Anastasio de Gracias uh, Foundation, which uh, tries to recover historic memory on the aerial bombardments on civil society. Uh, military strategy that today unfortunately still being used in wars not too far from us. In the Mediterranean basin, basin, we can see it, unfortunately, we can continue to see aerial bombardments that we clearly condemn from here. This painful present in which children, the elderly and women are being punished is linked to our history, the history of our country, the history of Madrid. Because us, Madrid, the civil society of Madrid were the first victims in the Spanish Civil War when we started suffering aerial bombardments. On the heads of our parents and grandparents, they experimented the terrible techniques of um, war that they're still being used. This is something we must not forget. We must never forget this in order to empathize, in order to be able to defend the populations that, as I was saying, are still suffering those atrocities. And in order not to forget, we have to investigate, study, research, and get to know things. Our country, after a long period, and fortunate period of democracy, we still have dark areas of silence about what happened in the civil war and in the dictatorship. That's why we think it's important from the foundation to generate fora such as this, as the one we are presented today, where the light, reason, and knowledge can reconcile us with our tragic past. In these opaque distances, we still find in the shadows the memory of the aerial bombardments in uh, Madrid that were systematically hung over the Madrid civiliz civilization. National and international uh, journalism talked about it at the time. Unfortunately, Madrid citizens seem not to be aware of that fact that they were placed in that situation of history. In this uh, European uh, forum, we start from the, what's local, Madrid, to go to the universal, to the globe, linking the past to the present, because this is continuous. We can't forget that. Our history is uh, deeply rooted with uh, Europe, and there are many uh, new um, speeches being uh, trying to justify the coup d'etat that seemed to forget this. Our war was a uh, precedent to the World War, to the Second World War. The fascist forces were a clear uh, aim for that uh, success and to make sure that the democracy ended in our country. The research of from France, Germany, the UK, and Spain are going to share here with us some knowledge that I'm sure will shed new light on those dark, shadowy areas we were speaking about, especially developing certain aspects and talking about certain experiments that unfortunately took place in German and Italian um, 
our industry after what happened in our country. But this is uh, being done in order to create new bonds, European bonds between all the participants, new serious relationships that allow us to create common memory on the shared suffering in the successive conflicts and understanding that no one wins in a war, especially even less in a civil war like ours. I would like to finish without thanking all the researchers and historians that are participating, all of them top uh, level historians. I also would like to thank the Foundation Granzi, Foundation Pablo Iglesias, the Foundation EVC and the Confederation of Italy. Thank you to the researchers from Photodoc and the Faculty of Documentation Sciences and the University Complutense, without whom we wouldn't be able to be here hosting this event. And finally, thank you to the European Agency for Education and Culture for giving us the financing line for projects of European memory. It is key, it is very interesting. And without a doubt, I would like to warmly thank all the people who are here. Let's make the most to try and develop this project and let's make the most of the memory of the teachings of our past so that hopefully these facts uh, do not happen again in the present or in the future. Thank you all very much for your attention. Now I give the floor to the director of the Foundation, Pablo Iglesias, Alfredo Sánchez Montesaire. I'll stay here. Can you hear me from here? Perfect. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jose Maria. First of all, I would like to thank the Secretary of State and the Secretary General of the Complutense University, and I would also like to thank the hospitality of the Dean of this faculty. On behalf of the Foundation Pablo Iglesias, which I chair, first of all, I would like to talk about how happy I am to be part of this initiative within the, the Europe for Citizens program, not just because of the goals of that program, but also because of the content, the great content that the leader of this project, which is the Anastasio de Gracia Foundation, has uh, created. Without a doubt, it's not just of extraordinary interest, but it uh, has great scientific and academic rigor. And I think that we just need to look at the program to know that. I would also like to say that the Public Iglesias Foundation, for us, it's uh, really um, great to collaborate with other foundations on a democratic and historic memory. We have been doing this in the past, but it's true that over the last few years we've been in reiterating that need for collaboration and how important it is to put in common our efforts, our resources, and our alliances in order to obtain funding so that we can continue to work on the basis of a mandate that in the case of the Pablo Iglesias Foundation comes from that legacy, from that heritage that our archive presents and represents in the socialist and social movements in general. In that sense, I would only like to express our satisfaction for participating in this event, in this international conference. I would also like to send our greetings to our Italian partners that, without a doubt, have helped us in the past and are still doing it in order to have a less of a local vision. And having said that, I need to make some comments or reflections based on the core of the topic, the exportation of aerial bombardment to Europe from Spain. And I would like to talk about that by mentioning one fact, one fact that is unique, key, in order to understand the Republican exile of people from Andalusia, and that was the those 
that was hundreds and thousands of people who just flew away. They fled. I don't think we can talk about aerial bombardments and terror, even though that was terror that came from air, but also from sea and from land. And I wouldn't like to talk about that without that massive uh, fleeing of Andalusians from Malaga, not just from Malaga, but mainly from Malaga. And he didn't have a president until the Second World War. They were fleeing, trying to find an exit towards the Republican Spain, because Malaga had been taken by the Italian and the fascist troops between the 7th and 8th of February of 1937. In order to make that comment that I think had to be mentioned as an Andalusian myself, I decided, well, to find documents. And for instance, I found a contemporary documents of the time, at uh, the time of 1937-1939, and that is written and it has been published by Fernando Martinez López, Secretary of State for Democratic History, a great uh, scholar of these topics. And uh, since I read it and I studied it, this has really helped me to say that Reinforcers, reinforcements never came to defend people from flee, flying away, uh, from fleeing. It was a discoordinated attack. We're talking about 50,000 people. We're talking, in summary, about a wave of people, families, whole families carrying their babies. Some were left behind or were left on the way. Some of them passed away and suffered due to the aerial bombardments, but also the sea bombardments, um, such as Juan Carrera by Admiral Cervera. Many of those people scattered. Many children got lost and didn't see their moms again until they got to Valencia, Catalonia, or France. The people who walked the way, who walked the way to Almeria from Malaga, probably thought that after Almeria, France was just around the corner. This is also taken from the documentation I've just mentioned. I would like to render homage to those people who suffered, to suffer what we called the fleeing away or the fleeing out. And I finish, I finish by thanking you all and you can count on the foundation. And I would like to thank the other foundations and the university. I think that we are moving forward a lot in those collaborations and cooperation. So at least that is our aim. And I would like to invite you to the summer courses of El Escorial, the summer university, and a course that we are sponsoring on the 14th, 15th, and 16th of July, where we will no longer talk about the past and memory and historic memory, but we'll talk about the future. We'll talk about novelties and the reconstruction of Spain from different standpoints after the pandemic. So you are obviously more than invited to participate with the university in this summer course. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to have the intervention from Italy now. Good morning, everyone. Innanzitutto, io chiedo scusa per la mia assenza. Mi avrebbe fatto molto piacere venire a Madrid e stare con voi, ascoltarvi e conversare. È molto bello il fatto che questo convegno 
si tenga in presenza e a un certo punto sem sembrava così improbabile. So quanto gli organizzatori consideravano importante riunire a Madrid tutti i relatori e so che non hanno perso questa speranza neppure quando la pandemia sembrava mettere a rischio questa possibilità. E, è un bel successo che i partecipanti possano conoscersi di persona, ascoltarsi e dialogare da vicino. Dopo molti mesi di dialoghi esclusivamente a distanza tutti potrete ritrovare il piacere della vicinanza e io questa mattina un po' vi invidio. La mia assenza è semplicemente dovuta al fatto che io non sono ancora vaccinato e lo sarò soltanto la prossima settimana e ho considerato sconveniente e rischioso il viaggio e il soggiorno sapendo che avrei potuto comunque rivolgervi il mio breve saluto questa mattina. La Fondazione Gramsci ha accolto con molto interesse l'invito a partecipare a questo progetto per molte ragioni. La, la Fondazione Gramsci è un istituto culturale che conserva nei propri archivi molta documentazione che riguarda la guerra civile in Spagna. Innanzitutto diari lettere, scritti, memorie dei principali dirigenti del Partito Comunista Italiano che parteciparono alla guerra civile. Si tratta di archivi assai rilevanti, basta fare tre nomi, Palmiro Togliatti, Vittorio Vidali e Luigi Longo. La Fondazione Gramsci è un istituto di ricerca che si occupa della storia tra le due guerre mondiali, della nascita e dell'avvento del fascismo, dei suoi sviluppi e quindi dell'intera storia dell'antifascismo. La guerra civile spagnola è perciò al centro dei nostri interessi permanentemente. Ci sono ragioni che attengono anche allo studio della storia successiva, la resistenza e la costruzione della democrazia in Italia dopo il fascismo. L'esperienza della, della Spagna è ineludibile per ricostruire e interpretare la storia italiana negli anni della seconda guerra mondiale e negli anni immediatamente successivi gli anni che vanno dalla liberazione alla promulgazione della Costituzione repubblicana, fondamento della democrazia italiana. Ieri 2 giugno abbiamo festeggiato in Italia il 75 anniversario della Repubblica, nata nel 1946. Non c'è soltanto l'eroismo dei combattenti, la rivendicazione dell'apporto dato dagli antifascisti italiani, lo scontro tra miliziani fascisti da una parte e i volontari delle brigate internazionali e infine il nesso tra la lotta combattuta in Spagna e la, la, la lotta dei partigiani italiani tra il 1943 e il 1945. L'esperienza spagnola è al centro del pensiero politico dei padri della Repubblica e della Costituzione italiana. Questo è un aspetto ancora poco indagato. Faccio soltanto i nomi di tre padri della Costituzione italiana. Giuseppe Di Vittorio, ed è assai significativo che la Confederazione Generale Italiana del Lavoro sia tra i partner di questo progetto. Pietro Nenni, leader dei socialisti italiani, e Palmiro Togliatti, il massimo dirigente comunista, fino al 1964, anno della sua morte. A loro devo aggiungere il nome di Carlo Rosselli, ucciso in Francia nel 1937, che dedicò alla Spagna tutti gli ultimi suoi scritti e la cui eredità fu raccolta dal Partito d'Azione, una delle forze politiche più impegnate nella resistenza e nella costruzione della democrazia dopo la fine della guerra. 
Si tratta di un peculiare pensiero politico, maturato nel corso della guerra civile spagnola. Il caso di Togliatti è certamente il più emblematico. I suoi numerosi scritti sulla Spagna dal 1934, addirittura prima, del, mostrano la rilevanza di questa esperienza nella sua complessiva riflessione politica sul fascismo, sulla democrazia, sulla guerra e sulla pace. Si può dire che senza l'esperienza spagnola il pensiero di Togliatti non sarebbe stato così originale. Chiudo. La Fondazione Gramsci è rappresentata dal professor Gianluca Fiocco, che oltre ad essere uno specialista del tema che verrà affrontato nel convegno, è anche l'ultimo biografo di Palmiro Togliatti, oggi uno dei maggiori studiosi del suo pensiero politico. Sono molto felice che abbia potuto accogliere il nostro invito a partecipare. Io vi saluto facendovi i miei complimenti. Saranno due giornate di lavoro intenso su temi assai rilevanti. Vi seguiremo con molta attenzione. So we close these presentations, the first block, and we're just going to proceed with the inauguration of this conference with the intervention of the State Secretary Fernando Martinez and the General Secretary of the University Universidad Complutense. Unfortunately, COVID makes us go a bit slower, but security is important. And from the Complutense University and the organization, we're taking every measure possible to guarantee that security. We will come back soon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. But thank you as well, most of all, for having called me to be here um, on behalf of the university. I am very happy to be here in this faculty because I feel at home here the present dean and the previous dean and Gloria, the manager, have always treated me very well here. And also because of the topic that we're going to talk, talk about, talking about memory from a special point of view. And we were talking about it before. I think that it has been a topic that touches on every angle. There is literature, art, law, history, a multidimensional treatment of the issue. And in the previous board, they were talking about uh, the bombing terror. And I was remembering my grandmother and how she was telling me about the bombings nearby 
in the street Cristobal Bordieu between Alonso Cano and Modesto da Fuente and she was hit in a leg and so she remembered it forever and she said that it was the most horrible thing more than hunger and family in the end she was taken to Valencia so that this made me think of that also I would like to be to express my thanks to the organization and because of the um, place chosen here at the University Complutense. In our university, we have been rethinking all the important issues with regards to the historic memory in April, the dean will remember, the council approved the reparation of the people who had to go in exile. And uh, we thought that it was a gesture that was very important to recover the figure of these five Deans, um, they were in relevant political positions, and some of them because of their political stance. It was not because they belonged to a, a special political party, and some, and this is something to regret, is that they were neutral. So we are happy to be part of this event and hold this event, and we can frame this as the memory, as Primo Levi said, the, we have a duty for memory, and this has been difficult in Spain for a long time, but I think we are at a time right now which is very good. and. The key to this is that, and I was saying this to Fernando, that in the last two months we have met each other in several places, and finally this is moving forward, and not in a clandestine or quasi-clandestine way, and, and like in 1912, we had to uh, hide. We have here the top authority in the matter. So for those of us who work in issues to do with historic memory, and there are militants, we have in front of us special moment because we can be hand in hand with the politicians something that hasn't been possible until now. And I think we should take advantage. We have a lot of hopes in the text of the new historic memory, logically, because if everything goes according to plan, then we will be able to achieve several things at the same time. But there are two key things that we're going to be able to achieve, which is to cancel all the resolutions from the Frankism, Francoism and also to bring all the courses that were hidden. So I think we should be happy about this, in this particular issue. I don't have anything else to say apart from thanking all the organizers for the magnificent job that they've done, especially the faculty, because it's not easy to organize hybrid events with people that will come in online from other countries and uh, having to organize this as they go along. And especially, I would like to recognize their Gloria Conde's work is, uh, as always, impeccable. And also to say how happy I am from a personal point of view and an institutional point of view because of this event, and also because we have here in, in the inauguration um, with us the State Secretary of Democratic Memory, Fernando. Thank you so much. The University Complutense is your, not only your neighbor, but it's also your home um, every time anytime you want to come here. And so I will give him the floor so that he can give us his presentation. Thank you so much, Fernando. Good morning, everyone. 
Thank you so much to the General Secretary Araceli of the Complutense. We have been seeing each other several times recently to talk about memory issues. Thank you so much, Dean, for holding this event. And also, our special thanks to Acfitel, the Foundation Pablo Iglesias, and its director, Alfredo Sánchez Montesenil, the representation in representation of the Foundation, Gramsci, Francesco Yassi, to participate in this event with us, this event that, talk, that talks about Spain and Europe and is uh, linked by terror, terror that starts in the civil population in Spain because of the 1936-1939 war, and that is going to continue in Europe. So before, the president of the Anastasio de Gracia Foundation said that memory, the memory of Spain is the memory of Europe, and this is one of my reflections. The reasons why this is the case, and precisely in these particular times that we're going through, as we are passing the law of democratic memory in Spain, that is linked to the main international laws and human right laws, is the duty of memory. This international conference is perfect to reflect on the aerial bombings that are part also of this memory of Spain and are, are part of this European memory. I think that it is of great interest right now and it is a great opportunity for this event to take place, especially, among other things, to highlight how important it is to rescue for the academic and public debate and also for the construction of the democratic memory issues of great importance that we're not going to always find in the headlines of the newspapers or the news bulletins or the trending topics of the social media. So I would like to reflect on the aerial bombings, strategic aerial bombings. As you know, they were designed to cause damage to the infrastructures, especially it was destined to harm the docks, factories, railways, but also quickly something was added to harm the civil population, to create terror and horror to make the civil population vulnerable in the process of the war. Bombings that open a new era in the war, the war that was coming to a total war, a era with great dramatism because of the impact, indiscriminate impact on the civil population. So a few days back, we were celebrating some events to recognize the men and women of the exile in Spain that fought for the liberation of Europe. And on the 8th of May, 1945, they achieved something so important, the unconditional rendition of the Nazi Germany in front of the Allies. So behind this rendition, there was a devastated Europe to the millions of dead in the front lines, to the discovery of the horror, the extermination comes, and a trauma of the civil population was added to that, a trauma of a population that was submitted to a terrible and destructive war and submitted to a new, new forms of repression that weren't seen until then and were ignored until then in the war planning. This has a lot to do with what we are going to be reflecting on in this conference, which are the aerial bombings. So a few days back, we remember that the great victory over fascism allow us to build 
on the ruins of Europe, the ruins of that war to create a Europe that we know well today and that we would like to take care of it as a treasure, having seen what the terror and the horror brought to us in the Second World War. A Europe for which the memory of these dramatic events constitute an imperative, an ethical imperative, that all governments have the responsibility to assume and the institutional respect for the millions of victims of these wars, but also for the millions of people that in different ways were in the midst of the fight against fascism. A fight that in the case of Spain meant that a lot of volunteers came, which were the uh, international brigades. They came to fight in a foreign country with a completely different culture to theirs. But they were fighting fundamentally against fascism because they understood and they saw that the war in Spain from 1936 to 1939 was the first combat to defend the democracy that were so hard to achieve. So that's why the, I would like to say that the memory of Spain is the memory of Europe. Our war from 1936 to 1939, that was the first battle against fascism. It was the first battlefield against fascism. And also, and this is what we're going to talk about in this conference, is one of the first experiences of terror, the war terror, the aerial bombings that were exported to Europe. And this links us to the European memory too. It was just not only our exiles who fought against fascism to liberate Europe and build Europe but also to reflect on the impact of these bombings, especially on the civil population, the fenelessless, and behind the front lines. So as we analyze deeply war conflicts in Spain and other places in the world, it becomes more and more important, the bombings, especially the indiscriminate bombings towards the civil population for a spaces for massive bombing completely incompatible with human rights. So the memory has to visit constantly these spaces of terror because it is a duty of memory. I reiterate this concept. It's a duty of memory to recognize the suffering of the victims, those who died, but also those who survived and took this panic and this collective tragedy with them. The aerial bombings that we know about that are the oldest, as it happened in the Ottoman War in 1911, and those that the Germans did against Great Britain in the First World War, seem now limited after seeing the terrific firestorms of smoke that the plain squads left behind. The exponential development of military technology between the First World War and the Second World War that allow a greatest endurance of the citizens, allow the planes to fight higher, incremented the destructive power and the effectivity of bombs, and the sky was the center of the military action changing forever the scale of armed conflicts. I think in this conference, we're going to reflect a lot on the war. There is even a presentation on the total war. Sometimes historians, when we talk about wars, we signal a landmark. It was not the same with modern wars, with professional armies, and that the population didn't take part in the war, only the professional army were in the war, and the rest of the population carry on with their normal life. But this changed radically 
when in the midst of the French Revolution, the Jacobians put into place the war economy concept and all the population were at work because everything happened behind the world, especially the fight against the Christians and all the revolution in France. Imagine this is what marks the contemporary war. And imagine the exponential leap that war took when the bombings came into place, when the sky was key in the military action, not only to attack the combat fronts or the infrastructure that helps the process of war, but fundamentally when there is a hostile process, a terror against the defenseless population that walk from Malaga to Almeria, fleeing as they could, and also the aerial bombings, not only aerial bombings, but also ground bombings from the cities in the trenches. This changed radically the concept of war and provokes a lot of suffering. And so the history of the development of aerial terror in Spain was a testing field to their explosion in the Second World War, as we are going to analyze in this conference. I was talking about this before, and I was listening to this. The dean said, or oh, remember, that newspaper in Santander in Cantabria that said in the year 12, 1912, what could happen if the Germans invaded the French sky. Well, in Spain, the war starts in the war in Morocco. So our army started this. We're going to be able to see this in a great exhibition that we are preparing from the State Secretary of Democratic Memory, which is called the um, Twilight, the Spanish Twilight. And we're going to talk about the Moroccan war and the role of the attacks on the civil population. This is where it started in Spain, this type of bombings. But it was uh, really in the war in 1936-1939 when we saw the terrific strategies of systematic aerial bombings on the civil population. So sadly, Dean, the Dean was saying that Madrid was the great first capital in Europe to suffer this. We know the vital importance that had in the development of the war in Spain, the su aerial support on, for the rebels from the fascist Italians and also the Condor Legion from Germany, but also in a limited way, but very importantly, the role developed by the Russians. So a substantial part of these bombings was for the civil population in the trenches, an atrocity that extended to the rest of Europe in 1939, where the Second World War started. From the beginning of the Spanish War, we have been seeing aerial bombings in several civil towns, especially from the uh, Italian and German aviation, the Condor Legion. But also, there were some aerial bombings from the uh, Republicans. At the beginning, it wasn't too much, but over after the bombings of Guernica, the topic escalated to Europe, in the European front. There is an, an exhibition on Guernica and, and a presentation on Guernica. And so this started to escalate internationally, and we were analyzing what happened. So the topic of Guernica was discussed in the non-intervention committee, and also in the Society of Nations, and we 
had a resolution where we condemned the resorts of the Spanish against the right of people and the bombings of open cities. So over the war, at the end, in the 1938, the impact of bombings internationally was so huge that we created a commission it started uh, with the great with Great Britain and France and then the Vatican to analyze what was happening with the bombings on important cities, sp important Spanish cities, especially on the civil population in Spain. So cities and towns that are in the program of this conference, especially Guernica and all other places like Barcelona, Bilbao, Durango, Almería, Jaén, Ochambiano, Alcañiz, Cartagena, Alicante, Málaga, Lleida, Granollers, or Tarragona, that were the beginning of other bombardments in Dresden, Rotterdam, London, Hamburg, and Berlin, hide tragic stories that we shouldn't forget about because the collective suffering experience under bombings, especially in vulnerable populations, create a collective trauma in society that can last for generations. Also, the history of these cities is full of memory places. You can walk in Almería, my city, and you can find a big shelter of five, five kilometer long shelter to flee from the aerial bombings that were coming systematically. They were massive after the fleeing of the population and this population that was in the docks and was bombarded by the nationalists. So after that, that, we created a shelter. And then in Alicante, you can see another big shelter after the massacre of more than 380 people after the bombings over the central market. These are memory places, shelters, where people hid. These are memory places to know and to understand that we shouldn't repeat the terror and horror that the war in Spain was, but also the Second World War. In this important international conference, we're going to be talking extensively about military alliances, war strategies, total war, military technologies, war experiments, models of bombers and the caliber of weapons and their destructive capacity, but also the trail, the horrible trail, the ruins of the, our legacy, the terrible losses for the civil population, their injuries in their, the injuries in their bodies and the psychological print, footprint in their memories. It is really all the millions, it's really awful to think about all the millions of bombs that they saw over their heads. When one thinks about the bombings over London in December 1940, in a few years, the, Nazi, the Nazis throw more than 100,000 bombs that created a fire, horrible firestorm in the city, and the bombings over Dresden launched by the Allies in several aerial attacks, four aerial attacks between 13th and 15th of February of 1945, two, almost two weeks before the rendition of the German. So they dropped over the currency of Elba more than 4,000 tons of bombs, incredibly explosive, and other explosive devices starting with a firestorm that destroyed the, the historic center. A terror, as you know, that, that ended in the horrible events of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. So from then, the development of military technologies, and in the case of the big countries, the need to limit the casualties after horrible experience, traumatic experience 
If we think about the Afghanistan for the Soviets or Vietnam for the Americans, this has made the bombing role worse. Launched from higher altitudes as a military resource in every armed conflict. How the situation has changed. Bombings in the long, in long distance bombings. So a final reflection to value the more recent bombardments, not only from the strategically point of view, but also for the perception of the public opinion locally and globally has of them. So frequently, bombings are linked to parallel propaganda wars. Against all evidence, the Francoist narration of events was blaming the Republican. But as the strategy becomes more exclusive, the language that hides it, that minimizes them or that vandalize them, it gets more complicated. So I think that you probably remember the first Gulf War in 1991, the Desert Storm Operation, the so-called Desert Storm Operation. It was the first conflict that we had access to in real time. And some authors have talked about this as the telewar. We were, probably all of us, in front of our screens, seeing how the missiles were being launched from the bombers, American bombers. It was a war with a very complex design based on the radical invisibility of real violence and the complete disappearance of the opponent, the Iraqi opponent, seen a cascade of visual effects and a lot of tales, medical tales, hiding after this video game aesthetics, a military strategy of what we talked about later on as commotion so and fear. So a firestorm that was uncontainable, that you couldn't react to humanly, and it was destined to paralyze radically not only the uh, enemies, but also the civil population. So the new social media amplified even more the capacity of distortion and banalization in terms of the news. Bombings are bombings. We can't just let ourselves go just by what we see on TV. So only the memory of the victims can stop us from doing so, from thinking that this video game effect. So we, bombard, we see the bombardment of civil populations constantly. In, in other cities massacred by bombs like London and Dresden, we have a collective conscience, an institutional conscience of this past. But this privilege that we have in Madrid has been silenced for years. We have forgotten this because of the need that the Francoists have to defend Madrid and to delete from the memory the city that resisted to hide the steps that took that the steps for the rendition. And my duty is to remember this always. This memory and not forgetfulness, what will allow us not to repeat this, is to think about never again coming from the reflection of this tragic past of the Second World War and the Holocaust, which should strengthen the democratic societies. I'm sure that this conference is going to be a big exercise to learn from our democratic memory, and it's going to contribute to all of this, especially the knowledge, history, and moreover, the strengthening of our societies, our democratic societies. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear Secretary of State. Thank you so much, dear Secretary General of the Complutense University. To close this opening session of the conference, I please ask you to come to the front of the table.
And I'm also going to ask the director of the Public Relations Foundation, the dean of the faculty, and in the director of the Letha Foundation to also come to the front, please, so we can take a picture. Muy bien, pues. Okay. So we say goodbye to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the fact of the University, and now we continue with the presentations. And I would like to present our uh, next guests, Enrique Bordes and Luis de Sobron. I think they are putting their mics on. Both of them are architects, lecturers at the Complutense University of Madrid, and. Um, authors of the of the book that has just been uh, published a uh, Madrid bombardment uh, that gives a real tragic view of the bomb of the bombings in Madrid and about how somehow in the city we still find the traces of those bombings physically in the cities of the in the buildings of the city but also psychologically and they're going to talk about that. And without further ado, I leave you with Enrique Bordes, Luis de Sobron, and the talk entitled uh, Bombarded uh, Madrid, a plan for memory.
Punto com. Uh -huh. eh, Enrique, tinyurl.com. Ya lo vemos aquí. Para nada. No te preocupes. Pero está bien. Ya está. Ya está. Pues ya estamos. Sí, adelante. Bueno, buenos días. Well, good morning. Uh, sorry for the slight technical delay. First of all, um, we both would like to thank you. Well, to thank the invitation by the Complutense University and the foundations, and also Jose Maria Oria, who invited these two political students or professors to this university. I wanted to present this um, project, in which we've been working since 2017, bombarded Madrid, uh, map for memory, and it's based on that over Zúñiga's uh, concerns uh, raised on us a few years back when spoken about the bombing, when looking into the streets, said uh, houses were destroyed and will be rebuilt. And when we leave, it'll be like a dream. It seems that there is no trace of that memory of that trauma of bombardments, bombings in Madrid. And as architects, we started working with a map that in 2019 uh, officialized after the now disappeared um, Office of Human Rights and Memory of uh, Madrid. Last week, we were lucky enough to take the next step of the project, presenting a book that kind of shows the process of this map of bombarded Madrid with the building of Calle Ruda number 10 that became an icon also thanks to a Madrid artist, J.J. Gómez. And this takes us to this map in which we've been working on. And our intention, our desire as architects, was to give some visualization, to make visible that destruction uh, versus the abstraction of the data. Our key working tool is drawing, and in the drawing of the city, in the case of Luis and myself, in this case, a drawing of destruction, not of construction. It's not a normal drawing for architects, but it is a drawing that allows us to understand and visualize in just a snapshot a terrible narrative of destruction. And in that sense, we also wanted to uh, tune in with the Lysotype, Lysotype, an institute that came up in Vienna, led by Otto Noira and with artists such as Gerard, that managed to create these images that gave an image of strength, uh, tension between armies, between the disease to try and give a narrative with drawings. We also started to see that there were other bombed cities that also 
had these traces that we were looking for, cities such as Venice, Coventry, Birmingham, London, all of them have an ex had an external attack and s had clearly mapped that history in the city. Even Berlin, it may be in a more muted way because, well, this destruction is not associated with a bombing in itself, but also had documented that destruction. In the case of Berlin, as you can see, it's ter terrorizing. And then our uh, twin city, Barcelona, that also worked on the Barcelona under the bombers. And he, there's even a book published before ours with the topography of destruction. And in terms of methodology, it is very similar to the work that uh, we both have carried out. And what about Madrid? There was a vacuum. When Luis and I started working on this, we tried to find out if there was a map. We talked to Omar Bravo, Wunde, who now does the prologue of our book, and told us, he told us there was no map, or it was unknown, or it hadn't been published. And it was at the time, at that time, we realized that we had a mission. We had to create it. It was then that as uh, lecturers of the University of Architecture, can you hear me? OK. Uh, maybe I have to put it up. Can you hear me OK? Yes. So it was then that with our role as architects and drawing uh, lecturers at the um, Faculty of Architecture, we decided to carry out this map of Madrid. In fact, of the destruction caused by the bombings in a specific field of work, which is buildings and city, with a dual objective that uh, Enrique has mentioned. First of all, we wanted to understand, based on drawings, a very complex reality the bombings that took place, based on a mean, on a city that is in itself very complex. To so try to understand the scope of those bombings in Madrid. And the second objective, which was also very important for us, which was to recover for citizens the memory of those events that as Edwiniga stated, in fact, uh, were left to be forgotten. So one of the first stages, obviously, was mm, documentation. We are in the documentation faculty, and we try to find documents that shed light on the topic of study. And what we found was very heterogeneous. We found registries. We found lists of uh, people uh, who were um, injured. We found some maps, some articles, written memories. But of all those sources, there's four that stand out the most due to the amount of information and data that it provided. And those four sources have its origin in four groups, uh, firefighters, photographers, police, the police forces, what would be now the municipal police, and architects. Those four groups, those four sources for us were very valuable, not only because of the amount of data that they provided, but also because they spoke of those four groups of civilians, three of them, in fact, deeply related to the local authorities. And they spoke those uh, Civilians spoke about how the city of Madrid and Madrid citizens had to fight an attack never seen before. Firefighters, just uh, to give us an idea, firefighters' uh, documents uh, gave us what they called the intervention books. Those are books where uh, someone at a call center would record each 
exit uh, each uh, intervention by the firefighters due to the bombings, not just to the bombings, but also to everyday life issues, because obviously firefighters still had to carry out their duties. And in very detailed, we can see how they, well, they give us the date and the time in which the firefighters left, where they were going, and the reason why they were going there. We must say that some of these uh, notes, like the ones we can see on the right, also talk about times when firefighters are overwhelmed. They are unable to meet um, the magnitude of the disaster. And there we can already imagine what they have to select, where they're going to go and when, because they are putting out fires as best as they can. And then there are also some comments that talk about the heroic attitude of those professionals, how in terrible times they went and they continued to do their duty, even when they were under enemy fire, as we can see here, whilst they were carrying out their duties. Bienvenido Hernández was shot by the attackers that were still attacking the city at that time. I must say that we must duly say that the attitude of firefighters and this has been preserved thanks to the work done by Juan Redondo Torra former firefighter. I think it's necessary to mention his work. The second pillar of those of that research was uh, the urban police um, reports that also went to those incidents and spoke about the victims. They registered where those events happened. And this is included in lists done by the um, police by the headquarters of the police, and they also gave a list of where the bombs had fallen. With these books, with these uh, registries that clearly specify where and when, then we have all the documents carried out by photographers. Photographers, reporters who were like graphic notaries that gave witness of the disaster that was covering our city. And with these written documents, well, the pho photos say a lot about the intensity and the severity of the damages, but they don't talk about when. They don't give a note on when. And many times we've had to do some digging to find out where. Uh, digging based on visual references that we can still see in the city. In some cases, it's easy, like an old image of the street uh, Calle Mayor, or this one, this street in Arguelles. But in other cases, the digging was more difficult, sometimes impossible, due to vis lack of visual references. And also, I would like to mention that based on the photographs, uh, carried out by photographers, national photographers mostly. Na uh, f the photographies come from national photographers. And we have great figures such as Robert Capa. But there are also very interesting documents in this case of a very different nature done by the soldiers themselves who were bombing the city at the time. Aerial pictures carried out during the war, during the conflict and even a photo, a photo mapping flight done by a US citizen in 1941 after the war ended that spoke about a city that's just come out of a war. And finally, uh, another group, architects, who is uh, very, we are very keen um, I don't know, you can call it a corporation uh, kindness towards them, that l did many duties, protecting monuments. They even uh, managed the evacuation of thousands of tons of rubble. And we can see how they designed the destruction, how they drew the intensity of the destruction in the city, 
mainly, I guess, thinking about the managing of the subsequent reconstruction. They created areas uh, to um, or the protection of vulnerable or highly damaged buildings, and they even presented proposals to re for the rebuilding the day after the war. When the war, when uh, basically when they knew the war was lost at the time. All these sources are all partial sources. We were investigating a crime based on different reports provided by the civilians, but we do not have um, Four sources. They are partial sources, but they complement each other. We have 2,203 buildings affected, identified. And many of these sources, as Luis said, many of these uh, photographs are not dated, but we can uh, then look at the registers of the firefighters and we can see that, I don't know, building 40 is that picture. Or when the firefighters uh, working in the real, real cinema. Um, well, we know exactly when it took place and the pictures, so we can correlate registers to the pictures. In that sense, regarding those three sources, firefighters, police, and architects, we can see how they all agree. Dark uh, buildings, each icon is uh, 10 buildings, so they coincide with other sources, and they provide information also of buildings that are in all the sources. For instance, the photographs, we have given them special importance because they are visual testimony. And we can see that there are 801 buildings that have been photographed, but 347 are uh, the only source we have for them. Then we have 2,203 uh, buildings affected, and half of them are appear in two or more sources, or at least in one photograph source. The others were documented by just pure luck, sometimes finding a specific document, or thanks to Juan Redondo, who preserves that book on the interventions of uh, firefighters, and that came to our hands. So we are very far from the figures of the time. The Committee of Reconstruction of Madrid in the year 1937, just in 1937, documented 6,036 incidents in just a single year. And 1937 was not the worst year. It was the end of the 36 when the air attacks started. And we can see that we are still far from the reality at the time of those 2,203 versus the 6,000 in just a single year of the war. The map also has some graphical presentation. We wanted to start drawing the current city. It was important to anchor the memory process um, that uh, based on the present. So in that sense, we built the Madrid of today with an autumn Tones. This is now in November 1936, but this is the Madrid of today. And we have overlapped the Madrid of 1936, which was smaller, obviously. And we can see how most of the area has affected buildings. We've identified the affected buildings without looking into the degree of destruction, but understanding the buildings as bodies of that city, bodies that were affected by the aerial bombardments and the attacks. And when drawing or representing this graphically, this is a map of destruction. And those uh, dots are not aseptic. They are not small urban interventions in the city. They are destructive elements that have an expansion wave and that have an effect that goes beyond where they hit. And overlapping all those layers, we get this image of the map of Madrid, bombed. Based on that, well, then we go to the next stage. 
So once this uh, map finished, the next question we asked ourselves was, what's left of all of this? And I guess that's the question that many people thought of when they looked at the map. What's left of the, in the current city of that disaster? Because when you walk the city, you don't feel that you're walking through the streets of a bombed city. Where are the scars of those injuries? There's a first obstacle very well described by archaeologist uh, Gallego and Solé when they talk about Barcelona. When they dis describe the scars in the city after the bombings, they describe them as current but invisible scars. There are scars that are there in front of our eyes. They are visible, but we don't see them. We walk past them every day, but we don't identify them. We lack the knowledge. We lack the information in order to interpret those scars. Also, there's another difficulty, another obstacle, which we were able to check, which was the great amount of damages that were repaired after the war, obviously. The lack of means in the after the war made it necessary to make the most of what was still standing. So buildings, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, such as the Casa de las Flores, were damaged by the bombings. They were repaired whenever they could. So today it's also difficult to say that the huge bomb fell there. We need to remember that those scars are deeply related to the type of weapons used. We spoke about an evolution in weaponry and experimentation, experiments done with those weapons. I would like to say that they mainly use three types of missiles. Air bombings were called demolition bombs because, well, the name very clearly describes that these bombs were able to demolish partially or totally a building. Then we also had the luck factor, depending where they fell. Then there were other type of bombs, smaller size, that were called fire bombs, that were able to lead to high temperatures in a very nearby area. Those, they also depending, depending on the luck. There were buildings that were totally destroyed by fire. Others, like the ones we can see in these images, where the fire, maybe due to the work of the firefighters or for whatever other reason, was constrained to the top uh, floors of the building or to the roofs and were repaired. And finally, we have artillery missiles because air attacks took place mainly in November 1936, even though there were also some isolated attacks in January and December. But the artillery in Casa de Campo and Cerro de Los Angeles, uh, well, those missiles were launched from those two places until uh, the surrender of Madrid in March 1939. So this uh, had a lower explosion capabilities. And even though they led to clear damage in the structures and in the buildings, as we can see here, those damages were more localized and constrained, limited to a specific area. And they were obviously repaired without leaving a trace. And today, well, before we go to the next step, I would like to explain that we did try to analyze the damage in the city, establishing a classification, a typology, depending on the visual impact that the scars had left on the current city. In that sense, the remains or the scars that have a greater visual impact is what we call the urban gaps, uh, areas that were left totally empty in the city and that are still present due to the destruction of the buildings in other place. Even though they are the most visible scars, paradoxically, they are still invisible for us. For instance, the paradigmatic case 
of the uh, um, little streets in uh, near Seoul that led to the destruction of houses, as we can see here, next to the savings bank. And then we have what we call replacements, which is uh, those scars that came uh, from not being able to repair the damaged buildings due to the high impact that they had had. And in those cases, they had to be demolished and they built new buildings on those sites. Maybe not all of them, but many of the buildings that we see in the city from the 18th and 19th century, and that to a greater or lesser extent, seem awkward within the urban uh, environment are due to the destruction of buildings in uh, the city. And then we have transformations. These are scars that are more difficult, more, it's more difficult to identify and that can be seen in the transformation of the architectural changes in some of those buildings due to some repairs, but that under no circumstances made the building look like it used to originally, for instance, here in the Imperial College. And then we have remains, superficial damages due to the shrapnel of uh, bombs. And if we walk carefully through Madrid, we can still find mainly in the in granite lower uh, floors or, or basements where we can see those traces that have been left sometimes underneath the repairs. And finally, we have these two maps, a map for history, a map of the injuries that corresponds with a map of scars, so with the injuries and scars. Both of them are quite cold. Um, pieces in order to talk about what's behind it. Each dot on this uh, map has a history behind it, incomplete history. When we've published the project and when we first published it, we started receiving contributions. In this case, we received a while later the um, memories of a citizen in Madrid who spoke, I mean, in fact, the topic of his mail was the bombing of the Divino Pastor number five, where I live, two minutes away from where I live. And it wasn't in our uh, building. I mean, the, the evidence given by the citizen shows a family memory and family history. This is a photograph taken by his father, the picture of a building that was being uh, built again after a destruction. And on the back of the picture, there's a sentence, a key sentence. It says, my home after the bombing, Divino Pastor 5, November 1936. My home, my home, Madrid, after a bombing. I think that was a sentence that really touched our hearts and that it made us think of how many tough stories that are behind this map. And well, I mean, we are running late a little bit, but this is a testimony, an oral test. There was also an oral testimony that we wanted to show you, but we shared it with Carmen Cruda a while back and with Paki and with Teresa, two of our neighbors who spoke about the time of the bombing. And we want to render homage to them, to them, and we want to dedicate our work to them because they took pictures of our home after the bombing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Enrique and Luis. Just a small note. Apart from memory, I have two small daughters. And they have discovered because of me that Madrid was bombed. I think it's really important not only to remember and give a tribute to all these people who suffer and had it in their memories, but to communicate this to the future generations, because a lot of young people and children in this city don't know what happened here 80 years ago. And just because of that, 
this magnificent work that you've done is worth it. So thank you so much on behalf of the Foundation. We're just going to do a small break now for a coffee break, and then we will be back at around 11.30. Thank you very much. So, we're going to go back to the presentations with Gudmaro Gómez Bravo, who is going to be here with us through Sim. Um, we hope that uh, he connects. He's a professor of the contemporary history in the University of Madrid and one of the most important persons. He coordinates the group of the study of the civil war and Francoism. And he has studied about the Francoist repression and also concentration camps in Germany and here as a replication of the German concentration camps. He's going to talk about total war. Gudmaro is here. Gudmaro is really nice to say hello to you from here. We hope that you can listen to us. I have talked a little bit about your topic. I don't want to extend my presentation longer. And we're going to just listen to your presentation calling for total war. We can hear you, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to go down and to be able to communicate with him. Sorry about this. Can you hear me now? Yes? Can you hear me? Is the sound OK? OK, let's go. Thank you so much. Good morning, and sorry about the technical problems. Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry I can be there with you today. And I would like to thank the organizations that had made this conference possible. So I would like to introduce a number of questions rather than certainties through the results of the research. Uh, more than talking about my book, I'm going to talk about our book and our research group based on the need, to, the need for primary sources and to have access to the archives, military archives fundamentally, and the declassification and classification, first of all. Just to focus my presentation, I would like to open a presentation, if I can. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Essentially, this is what I would like to present today, a piece of work based on what the research project and the creation of Madrid at War that you have here. And one of its fruits was a collective book of 24 authors. And we all belong to the research group of civil war and Francoism. So this, these presentations, what we are working on, 
using the Francois perspective, the conception of a city based on the aviation still, and in the transition towards a total war, but with a lot of components of the modern world and conventional world, where that's what we said knocking at the doors of total war. It's not total war itself. So in the end, it presents all the components of the Second World War, but not to that extent. So it's a concept that is very special to the Francois war, is the rendition, the unconditional rendition, and this ends in the total war. And from the coup d'etat, how there is the recognition of a big city, what decisions they take, and what don't we know about those decisions? We know that of the bombings that our colleagues were talking about, and what was the control once the Battle of Madrid was over of all the area of Madrid and the preventive bombardment. In this sense, the objectives, and this is connected with information, and if we have time for debate the perspectives. So this is the map of Varela. It was in the Varela archive in Cadiz, and we can see how rudimentary was uh, the Francois knowledge of a city of what Madrid was. It's a, a very conventional of the con conventional representation of the control of the territory and of cities of other cities like Barcelona, but Madrid has a very peculiar characteristics. In the bombing, we see some features that are changing. And in this sense, we see not only the systemic bombing of a city and the population is a objective of the war, but we see how the type of bombing changes through time. This is something very important to mention. And we go from this conception of recognition of the city, and we see the interest here for to have a, see if I can express this myself. You were seeing this in the middle. Sorry. OK. I think you can see better now. Anyway, so this aerial recognition, this was the first phase. That's what the aviation used. And also, you can see this aerial recognition of the fields around Madrid, the outskirts outside of the city center that it becomes more complex, but at the end of the world, they know these spaces really well. So we ended up in a total world where the knowledge of the ground knowledge and the aerial knowledge is complete. So this Francois perspective can be seen here when they come to the clinic and they don't have a connection or they don't have a mapping, a significant mapping. What we see here is an information that doesn't resemble the information that they had a year later when they conquer the clinic and where they had, there was a need to uh, take on different buildings. So we have an army that doesn't know what they have in front of them. So in these places, these are objectives for artillery, not the aviation, just to open a debate of uh, trusting that, that they were going to win the preparation and concentrating in the errors or attacking or concentrating the fire on just one place or one space. What we don't know 
at least in the archive documentation, is not shown, is when it was decided, the, bomb, the bombings were decided. There is more literature about the experimentation of the type of bombing, especially from the Condor Legion and the Italian legionaries, but there is just under one direction, the Spanish one, but we don't know when they decided to start the bombings. And in the, at the beginning of October, there were some operations that didn't end up happening. The decision is not clear yet on those. But between July and October, we see this classic perspective of the column war. At the, we still have a lot of questions about this. Madrid doesn't have anti-aerial defense as it was demonstrated. The anti-aerial defense was not even in the defensive strategy of Madrid. So why was the decision taken on this systematic bombing with these features? It's still a question we ask ourselves, and it's a fundamental question to think about the war. So we think that uh, there is there is not an agreement between Franco and Nola. The bombing of Madrid is uh, Franco's plan. And we need to take into account that Madrid is not only a big space with uh, a city with one million people living in it, but it's also the capital of the country. And this is the essential or the most essential factor that is going to determine what happened in, in November 1936. So we have four types here of bombings. It's not one after the other. They are simultaneous bombings. This was the um, battle in Madrid, the stri strictly. So we see a different level of destruction, a different level of technology. And this experimental di dimension is the one that they are trying. The German and Italian armies, and is also of the like of a Francoist were described as the total destruction, the constant pressure on the enemy. And once the attack is detained, the step towards the siege. So how many types of bombing at the same time? This is new in the history of humanity, and it's not a positive thing. First of all, it's the psychological one, the deployment at working hours of the aerial forces so that they create this sensation of superiority and to force their rendition at the minimal military cost. Then there is a, a number of leaflets forcing the rendition. And after throwing the leaflets, then they start the artillery fire from the Cerro de Garavitas. This war is one of the best known pictures, not only destructively, but also showing the need of rendition for rendition and the effects, the psychological effect of this aerial superiority in the skies of Madrid in working hours, as I was saying. Secondly, the technical bomb bombing or logistical bombing that is also something that the Italians like, that they took for to the Mediterranean, and destined to destroy the factories and the supplying industry, and to stop supplies and destroy the main ways for supplying the main roads. This is uh, the advancements towards the siege. This is Legazpi, the roundabout of Legazpi. And the uh, worst one is the 
occupation, one in the, in the area of our wages, which is the most punished, because the operation is destined to connect with the Parque del Oeste, to be able to connect with part of the army in the Carretera de la Coruña. And if you have seen some pictures, in this is the fundamental effect of this conflict. There were whole neighborhoods that came down, and the weight of the bombings was increasing so that the army could walk in. This was a very risky maneuver, but it was the one that they stopped because Franco was recommended not to go forward with this one. So this is Arguelles, a photograph that is uh, a, a, a bit more detailed about these bombings. And there were whole neighborhoods, as I was saying, taken down. And then the, there was an effect this on the propaganda battle that was a disastrous effect for the Franco campaign. And this was also very damaged, and you can see how strong this bombing was. You can see that there was a gap created there. The fourth is the fire bombing is the advance towards Madrid. And it has a lethal effect in the school of Getafe. There were a lot of children dead in these bombings. And this picture was taken by the Republica. And it was used for propaganda. And this was used, especially internationally, to try and stop the Legion, the Condor Legion, that was accused of the excesses in the bombings. So this international media battle in which the Vatican even intervened, saying to loosen on the strength and also with, together with the increase of the bombings to connect with the army in the Carretera de la Coruña, then the state, Franco's state, recommended Franco to detain the offensive because otherwise there won't be a uh, capital of the state. In the 21st of November 1936, there was an important meeting. The attack, frontal attack to Madrid is stopped. There is a meeting in Getafe and Kinderland. And Varela, who is in Carabanchel, agree not to carry on with the frontal attack on Madrid because of the diplomatic cost and tail and also the material costs that the strategy entail. And a war starts that the German and Italian allies didn't like, but it was the war that Franco put into place and all the dictatorship mechanisms were put into place. This is a long war in which the aviation, as you, as you know, have a very decisive role. So what happened? Madrid disappeared in the history books and the studies on the civil war. It seems like the Battle of Madrid has moved on to the north. It's uh, the Battle of the Carretera de la Coruña on, on the sidelines. But strategically, it's moved to the north. But in reality, this is not the case. What happened is it's a, a type of war that has moved forward towards a total war, a modern world, but it's still it is a, a conventional siege. And in this sense, the aviation plays an essential role in terms of the role of the information and also in terms of the control of the objectives to destroy. So Madrid has this combined strategy that is going to deploy in the whole of the European continent uh, with the occupation of Poland with a combination of bombings and selecting the uh, information objectives. And Madrid was a testing ground um, in controlling the Republican secondary lines. Madrid is going 
to be at the side of the artillery and the Republican army has a defensive success taking the attack of Madrid away from the city, but the tactical result was not good in Jarama and in Guadalajara. The sideline battle that we know by the thesis of Jose Antonio Ruiz Casero. So there was a log uh, logistic control, an aerial combat with the Soviets. They really uh, tried to stop the Condor Legion. And in 1937, what we have, even though this is m the offensive, the Francois offensive is moved to the north. What we can see in Madrid is the capacity to bomb the north and also the outskirts of Madrid. The 26th of April, 1937, Guernica was bombed, and Naval Carnero was bombed also, and Alcalá de Henares was bombed. And at the same time, it's test they test the capacity of response to the attack of the enemy. So in the, the South Army um, bombs Motril, and the Francoist one can't bomb Madrid at the same time. And from 1938, what we can see is the progress of logistics and the control of communications by the Francoist aviation, especially the second half of 1938, where we see is the development and the deployment of the information service and military police in the Madrid, connected through the radio channels to the top authorities of the Francois state. And then the, in the Battle of Ebro, we see the tactics of this uh, total occupation of the big cities. What we see here from now on is to, this complete supervision of everything that hap goes in and out of Madrid. And we, they do this through the communication of the aviation, controlling the supply and the destruction of the military industry are the main levers of the aviation to force the rendition of Madrid. What we can essentially see through the national aviation is a, a ground information service the connection in the ground between the sky and the ground and this calculation of objectives, selecting the objectives and bombing if necessary. So what we can see between the Battle of Ebro and the end of the war in these four, five, six months, what we can see is the almost the last one the last stage before the preventive war, if forcing the rendition or the total destruction. What you can see here between November and December 1938 is the capacity to bomb all the bridges that connect Madrid with the road to Valencia. And at the same time, the knowledge of all the destruction operations that the Republicans do, if they change their logistics, if they have something underground, or if they have a train in 40 days, the Tarancon, the known as train of Tarancon, uh, is that go to Madrid, going around rivers to avoid this um, roadblock um, towards Valencia around Perales and Alta Cunha. This is the aerial control of all this area and the precision of the weapons and the supplies that come in Madrid because of the uh, information provided by the aviation. Through all this information in this last stage of the war, what we can see is the possibility of a total destruction, as it happened in the Second World War, at the end of the Great War bombings on the German cities. But in the case of the Spanish Civil War, it didn't happen. But it was used as a weapon of negotiation 
political negotiation. So what we know is that um, that uh, the control of the objectives, military objectives in Madrid, was such and in real time that they were used in the conversations of Burgos to force the rendition in exchange for n not doing the final Francois offensive. In fact, the information channels of Franco present the Republicans and was the objective that they have for the last month. And psychologically, it makes them go down, because they have all the information about Madrid uh, of and what they can do by this is the rendition of the Republican aviation, the unconditional rendition. And this takes us to the last stage of the total war, as I was saying, the rendition, the un unconditional rendition, as I was saying. So all of this we wanted to develop. And we wanted to represent this through a map that is not as perfect as the colleagues from the architecture department, but we would like to, to join efforts with them so that we can do it in an interactive and pedagogical way to have an intelligible map to see what the were brought to Madrid beyond the bombings that are a graphic, of course, proof of a destructive phase in the contemporary war. But beyond this first bombing month, we can see the rest of the stages of the total war that is going to happen in Europe at the end of our civil war. So that's all from me. I hope that I wasn't giving too much information that you can hear me well. And this is a project to try and see these objectives and to extract the knowledge of the Republican maps and what was happening really in Madrid to be able to move through the city with these basic systems of legends that you can see on the left hand side and to see the weapons and the fuel that was actually inside Madrid and some other objectives that were controlled by uh, sectors of three kilometers, areas of three kilometers. This opens a, a new debate. After the war, there were accusations of Republicans or some of the accusations of the Republicans to place objectives within the city where the civil population was living. This opens a new debate, as I was saying, but the defense of Madrid, in the defense of Madrid, the only goal was to go to the middle of it and get the army out of the center. And it seems like this was a good criteria. And I hope that this was graphic enough for you and uh, it was of your interest. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Guzmaro, for your presentation. And now we give the floor, well, we move on to the participation of the great Walter Bernaga, who can take his place now on the table. Walter Bernaga, for those of you who don't know him, he's an emeritus professor at the Erlanger Nuremberg University. He's also a commander of the Isabel La Católica Order. She ha he has received the merit of the Republic from Germany, and he's a mem full right member of the European Academy. We have with us a man with a long career, prestigious career and rigorous career, who also knows really well the war in our country and specifically the German participation in Guernica. 
before I give the floor to him and to his talk, I just wanted to add that to that prestige, he adds human uh, depth. He has participated with us as a guarantor, thanks to his prestige, for the defense of the Peyron Thelini number 10 house that Robert Capa photographed and became an icon of the children's vulnerability when faced with the bombardments. Thanks to him, people like him, he, the house is now protected. So I leave you with this presentation, which is called Bombardment of Guernica in the context of the air attacks in the time between the two world wars. Thank you very much, Jose Maria. Colleagues, dear colleagues, the World Exhibition held in Paris in the mid of July 1937 was devoted to the modern techniques and uh, progression ideas of the times. The key aspect of the exhibition was the function and the veneration of light and electricity in its multiple aspects, also regarding the destructive industrial and military machinery. The put into scene of the German pavilion by Hitler's architect Albert Speer suggests with his Herculean people in bronze and the highlighting of the technical German technique is basically a uh, peaceful and optimistic progression well. And that at a time when the German intervention in the Spanish Civil War was already clear to the whole of Europe. The exhibition can be considered as an example of the development of the society in the late period of in between wars, uh, which Walter Benjamin, looking at German fascism, critically called making aesthetic political life. The Spanish pavilion of the Second Republic and that same expo in Paris was focused mainly on the consequences of the technical destruction potential and its application in war. Compared to the first initial plans for the pavilion that had focused on the success of social progress in Spain of the Republic, the final project for the Spanish pavilion was devoted to criticizing the war operations of the rebels against the civil society. It positioned itself against the total war. It documented with multiple means its consequences and the fascist negation of war crimes committed, both in Spain, but also Germany and Italy. For many years now, the Guernica bombardment is included in the debate on historic memory and political in involvement and implications. The general context of this debate are aerial war and the two world wars. A later Asman includes the attack on Guernica within the general context of German crimes in Europe between 1914 and 1945. And I quote, the network of extermination and working campus that uh, took place throughout the Nazi dictatorship in Europe, uh, the fields of battle of the two world wars from the Marne River till Stalingrad, and the cities destroyed by bombs from Guernica going through Coventry all the way to Dresde are a lieu de mirage, the memoir, basically places of European memory. At the same time, he sees in Guernica, just like in Auschwitz, part of the negative foundational myth of the European post-war society. At the beginning of 2012, he was published in Germany an encyclopedia, three-volume encyclopedia, about places of European memory, it was called. In the second volume of that work, subtitled 
the House of Europe, we include the voice of Guernica, refer to not as the village, but first of all to the work of Pablo Picasso, and also referring to the Basque city and the German bombing of the 26th of April 1937. The article started with the words, and I quote, Guernica is ideally a place of European memory, and as such, due to its nature, is probably an exceptional case. It fulfills, we could say, with all the requirements of a place of memory, understood as a place of common memory, national, collective, and transnational reference of all the accumulated knowledge of social sense. On the internet, the Guernica painting by Picasso cannot only be found on the top ranking of the European list of critical paintings, but also in the list of heritage of uh, humanity. The article continues to argue that Guernica is a geographical place, but also a historic place that has as its place in the map and in history. And in truth, with the destruction of that uh, village, Guernica stopped being a regional or national place, and it became a reference, at least for Europe, but also for the world. The topic of this conference is a clear proof of that. The article also mentioned in this German encyclopedia ends by saying that Guernica, the painting, is just like Auschwitz, part of the negation foundational myth of the post-war European community, referring to a state that has overcome its difficulties with a new community order. Guernica quickly became a core place in the European memory of aerial war. That was probably due to the fact that compared to other bombings, immediately after the bombing, the many, several foreign journalists managed to go to the place of destruction and inform the world press about what had happened. The huge dimension of the international protest led Franco followers and Germans to reject totally any responsibility for the destruction of the city and to blame it on the Reds, on the Basque and Asturian Reds. Historic investigation has stressed many times the special nature of the aerial war in the interwar period between in the Spanish Civil War, but also in the destruction of many Spanish cities. There is a close connection between the specific way of leading the civil Spanish war and the perception of that war. It's not just something new for war history. I think it's because of the bombing of four cities and because of the killing of population from the air that has led to a new type of war where they started diluting the differences between civil population and soldiers. And it started, as we said before, it's when the total war started. Gabriel Cardona already spoke in the 80s of the 20th century about a field of military experimentation, experiments in Spain. He says, he writes, they tested weapons and military techniques that would then be used in the Second World War, uh, taking into account all the different elements of the future lightning war. Blitzkrieg, as the historian Anthony Beaver said in the Nuremberg, um, as the journalist said in the Nuremberg trials. Anthony Beaver, the historian, saw in the war of Spain an ideal field for experimenting with weapons and techniques in which politicians and aircraft had the supremacy. The Legion Condor documented the effect of the new war systems 
also through the use of photographic means, even taking into consideration minimum details, providing knowledge that would be of great use a few years later in the Second World War. Because of the specific way of leading this war, not only new propaganda ways of perceiving and representing the war started, at the same time, the type of area war had consequences uh, in war scenarios that were totally different. With regard to the facts in the serious historiography about the destruction of the village, today there are hardly any controversy. Compared to past decades where the bombing was the subject of multiple manipulation, both by the Franco's uh, side, but also by the German side, and more recently by the Basque nationalism. In the historiography of the Guernica case, we can distinguish several phases and versions. I'm not going to talk much about this. It's well known by all of you. Just a few words. The Republican side stated from the beginning that German planes had bombarded the city and that the responsibility fell both on the German side and on the Franco side. At the opposite, the national called mm, national ban side denied all participation of Franco's uh, and German troops in the bombardment. Uh, blaming the Basque or Asturian fighters. And this last version was held in Spain officially for several decades, even though slightly they had to stop uh, taking this position, which is unsustainable, clearly. The, also because uh, for former members of the Condor Legion had actually stated in public that they had bombed the city. What until then had been Franco positions became what could be called neo-Franco positions, especially since Vicente Talon in 1970 published the telegram that demonstrates that German planes carried out the bombing at the request of the frontline units. But both Talon and other neo Francoist um, authors such as Ricardo de la Cierva acquitted of any blame of the national leaders and obviously acquitted Franco, trying to demonstrate that the destruction of Guernica was the exclusive work of the German planes. This position is until now the position defended by most pro national authors. Contrary to that, over the last few decades, and based on the research of Southwark, Meyer, Viñas, and many others, and after reviewing the discussion on the responsibilities based on the bestseller of Thomas and Morgan Betts, historians not in favor of positions close to the previous Spanish regime have reached the conclusion that the top Franco's regime was co-responsible, at least morally, but even more, of the bombing. The first information about the bombing came uh, in the Republic, appeared in the Republican press on the 20th of April. There were two official notes, one from Jose Antonio de Aguirre, chairman of the government of Euskadi, and another from the Basque governmental delegation before the government of the Republic in Valencia. Franco's official cassette on the actual 20, day 28th specified the three pillars that the Franco's regime would use uh, as arguments in the future. It will deny the existence of German aircraft in Franco's regime. He will speak about the impossibility, the weather impossibility to fly during those days, and he would disseminate the idea that Guernica was set on fire by by the Reds, as they called them. The question on who bombarded Guernica is now no longer contro uh, controversial after the article by the British correspondent George L. Steer published in the Times on the 20th of April and after the first 
public statements of German President Aguirre, it was known that it had been German airplanes, the Junkers 52, the Heinkel 111, and possibly a Dormier 17, as well as a few Italian bombers, Savoia and um, Fiat and Saldo, that had carried out the bombing that had destroyed the city and killed its inhabitants. In 1975, in an investigation carried out by the Institute of Research of Military History of Fritzburg in Germany, in which historian Klaus Meyer tried to clarify the German responsibility in the bombing of Guernica, the author said as a conclusion of its um, investigations in German archives, and I quote, with a clear, certain probability, it's been certain, Guernica was exclusively destroyed by the aerial attack on the evening of the 26th of April 1937. The aerial attack was carried out by the Condor Legion and also some Italian fighting planes. A few years later, Maya repositioned his uh, statement and he said the intervention of the Condor Legion to support Franco's uh, regime helped develop and experiment with the German ideas of air war that would later be uh, used in the so-called lightning war in close combat, but also in the air war against targets outside uh, the operations, outside the operations of the land army. And it was accepted without problems that there would be victims, uh, civil civilians as victims. Uh, installing fear was one of the objectives as well. For the Republic of Germany, the Spanish Civil War has a long-lasting uh, importance as a barometer of uh, moral, historic, and political and cultural conscience. In the 80s, in the German public opinion, there was a heated debate about the Nazi era and its relationship with the present. In this discussion, they were trying to frame national socialism and its crimes in German history from Luther till now. They discussed about the originality or the comparison of those crimes. The German intervention in the Spanish Civil War and the destruction of Guernica were not part of that discussion. Nevertheless, they it, it does belong to this context because the position, uh, when looking at the destruction of Guernica, in that position we can see the non, no acceptance of the past and its relationship with basic issues of the German self-judgment and the political culture of the country. And Ricardo Miralles asserted that more than any other area in Spain, Euskadi, the Basque country, suffered the first experience of modern war, this modern war designed mainly by Germans. The combined action of artillery and foreign aircraft, followed by the frontal assault of the infantry and the tanks, should lead to the collapse of the Basque defense system. Durango and Guernica were the maximum expression of this air-land tactic that was uh, devastating and terrific. But for the general offensive on Vizcaya, the Condor Legion prepared over 60 Heiko bombing aircraft, two air squadrons of uh, prosecution, and 50 Fiat CR-32 planes from the Aviazione Legionaria from Italy, in total 150 aircraft with an artillery potential of about 200 pieces. As a consequence of this military domination, we can say that the German-Italian intervention was determining. 
uh, and important for the terrible lack of the Basque country. The Basque country was defeated by the overwhelming superiority of German and Italian aviation and artillery. And Gabriel Cardona has stated that the Basques had fortified their mountainous territory with trenches and shelters located in high places to dominate the valleys, and that turned them into perfect targets for enemy aircraft. The Basques had few machinery, and their territory was so narrow that the German planes could reach their targets even before the alarm had been raised. In this context, the Luftwaffe, the German Luftwaffe, made the most of the Spanish war to train its crew, to test its machinery, and to develop new combat techniques. The northern campaign was its lab to try out the strategic bombing of cities, attack on land, and air land cooperation. The first bombardment of cities had been uh, tested by the Condor Legion in Madrid, and in the Basque Country, the experiment continued. The biggest air attacks fell on Durango, who had no anti-air defense. The Northern War helped the Condor Legion develop air land cooperation techniques that no other air force dominated at the time. The aircraft that the German flew were still slow, but the Condor Legion was able to sensitive, considerably improve their war attacks, being able to test them out without uh, punishment because their enemies were very weak on air. Those bombardments were experiment field for the northern offensive in the spring of 1937 when the German aviation gave direct support to Franco's troops, his infantry troops, sending tons of bombs over the Basque Republican positions was the uh, fighters, the fighter jets shot on the ground troops. And that was the cases of Orandiono, Elorrio, Durango, and Eibar. From the beginning, the Germans were willing to use the Spanish conflict as an experimentation lab. Also on land, the German soldiers learned important lessons uh, for war regarding the improvement of tanks, the concentration in uh, armored divisions, the precision and power of their anti-air war canyons, the need to increase the size and power of their tanks, the need to have better connection between the war troops and the simultaneous air support to cover them. The squadron of experimental uh, bombarders, uh, the German ones, under the rule of war from von Richthofen started operating in December 1936 in Andalusia. The technical department of the Luftwaffe had analyzed the type of buildings of the Spanish cities, and it reached the conclusion that so far, no catastrophes could take place in terms of fires because the houses of the south of Spain didn't have much furniture. At the midst of December, they started bombing the Cordoba cities of Bujalance, Montoro, and El Carpio. At the time, it seemed that the German aviation had no moral problems to attack civilians because the destruction of those villages had no other goal than to be an experiment. Even before then, the Condor Legion had carried out systematic bombardments on Madrid. They were strategic attacks to end with the resistance of the population in the capital. And the Vizcaya campaign then 
was uh, like an academy for the German aviation that it improved its material and uh, combat techniques. The high kills were biplanes with great acrobatic uh, capacity and were like the fighter jets for the Luftwaffe. Since the mid of March 1937, the Condor Legion transferred them to the Spaniards because they were receiving the modern fighter jets Messerschmitt 109. The war in Spain was therefore, without a doubt, the perfect lab to try out weaponry and war tactics. Not just the Condor Legion, but also the Red Army saw in the war an opportunity to practice with its weapons and strategies, although he didn't make the most of the situation because he was subject to the Stalinist military orthodoxy. The Condon Legion, in turn, sent to Berlin detailed reports about the effects of the new weaponry systems. The Germans experimented in the Spanish war the terrible combination of the different elements of the future Blitzkrieg. Recent historiography underlines that the type of experimental bombing, such as in the case of Guernica, was for the Luftwaffe also in Andalusia and the Basque Country in general, and also in other parts of the Spanish territory. An experiment lab. The German aircraft made the most of military operations to acquire experience for a potential new world war. Also, operations in the north took on from the beginning the possibility of, a, of carrying out attacks to infuse terror and bring down the morale of the population. Contrary to the Germans, the Italian generals did not know or were not able to make the most of the Spanish experience. They spent a lot of money in the campaign in Spain, but they were the means, aircraft, tanks, artillery, that stayed there were not replaced. Their lack weakened the Italian armed forces in the Second World War. One of the issues that's most debated in historiography and is not fully resolved until now is the goal of the bombings, that is, the why of the destruction. When Franco's regime could no longer deny the bombing, the fact that Guernica was destroyed completely was presented as an accident, a non-intended accident. This version was still presented by most Germans that participated in the bombing, as well as by many of the German conservative journalists and US journalists until very recently. According to that argument, the core intention was to destroy the bridge of Renteria. But if that had really been the purpose, if the purpose had been to attack a bridge, we can question and ask ourselves if to destroy a bridge, you need to shoot down civilians, mobilize planes for three hours, and send firebombs. Many times we've insisted about the military strategic nature of the bombing, justified fully according to these arguments by war objectives or war targets. Strategic military targets could have been that bridge that brought together both sides of the river, or Orca, or the railway station, roads, um, weapons, a factory. By the day of the bombing, there was only one uh, group of Qudaris. The German uh, side had for very long tried to intensify the fight pressuring the Spanish the Spanish allies to block the roads. And on the 26th of April, uh, they said, we use immediately uh, recognition aircraft and fighter jets on the war, on the roads of Marquina, Guernica, and Gericaiz. The bombers, after coming back from Gericaiz, the experimental bombers and the Italian bombers harshly fell on roads and bridges, even sites 
close to Guernica on the east. There we have to close it. We have to really get a, a triumph against the uh, enemy. And Vigon will uh, press such a pace on its troops that all the walls, all the roads, sorry, at the south of Guernica will be blocked. To bomb Guernica, Richthofen tried a new procedure. After the bombing of the city, he stated, he stated in, in its diary, the city was destroyed in the following way. In the first attacks with fire bombs, we tried to make sure that the, the roofs would come on fire so that the inhabitants would come out of their houses. The following attacks were done with blaster bombs of 250 kilograms that had to destroy the pipes to make sure that uh, water was not used to put out the fires. The homes had to be destroyed so that literally they would crumble down. But it seems that the number of targets achieved was not as high as in Eber and Durango. End of the quote. In the aerial attacks of the Condor Legion, they didn't differentiate between military targets and civilian targets, not in the case of Guernica, not in many others, because the bombings had to demoralize both soldiers but also the civilians. And in fact, that bringing down the morale of the enemy was an important aspect for the German Franco's strategy. Franco himself and the generals Mola and Capo de Llano constantly made threats on the radio and on dailies as part of the psychological war against the Republican side, announcing that they would destroy villages and cities if the Republican population did not surrender. Subsequent questions have uh, separated themselves from the different theses of the military strategic goals of the attack or the theses according to which the key goal was to experiment with a new war material. They insist that the most important goal was to bring down the morale of the Basques, raising the level of violence. This tactic had started on the 31st of March with the bombing of Durango, in, had continued in April with the bombing of many villages of the Basque country on the 26th, Guernica, and if it had been necessary, Bilbao itself would be destroyed in order to punish, in the words of General Emilio Mola, a perverse people that aims to challenge the irresistible cause of the national idea. The bombing in this interpretation had the aim of destroying, basically putting the city on fire and demoralizing its population. Only then, only then can we explain the use of explosive cluster bombs and fire bombs and the shooting of civilians. Also, Richthofen had spoken about the total technical success, which would have been difficult to understand if the key goal of the attack had been the destruction of the Renteria Bridge, which, in fact, was not destroyed. A consequence of the bombing was, in fact, the lack of resistance offered at that time by Bilbao that fell on the 19th of June, 1937. The morale had been significantly destroyed amongst the uh, civil civilians. About the bombing of Guernica in German historiography, it's quite a interesting to look at the existing relationship between historic approaches and political positions. In any case, it's outstanding how long German historians uh, scientifically worked on this topic and how their arguments were still uh, trying to minimize the Guernica case, accepting the simple theory that the objective of the bombing was just solely to destroy the Renteria 
um, bridge to absolve or quit the Condor Legion of the intention to bomb the city and to not even question itself about the consequences of the bombing. In German historiography, we can hardly see that moral sensitivity constantly referred to when analyzing the past of the country. And I come to the end. The Guernica topic is for the Basque country, for Spain, and for Germany, a past that has not gone past. It is still part of the public opinion of historians and of politicians. With regard to Germany, the treatment of the bombing and its consequences clearly shows a whole series of deficits in the recovery of historic memory. Therefore, there is no reason to show satisfaction with the development of the debate because there are many omissions, there are too many vested interpretations. The guilt analysis and responsibility analysis sets the basis to value actions from the past. But that analysis must also include statements and consequences of the current behavior. There is the suspicion that the discussion on the Guernica case has been aimed at creating a historic image that manipulates the truth. And we must remember the words of the former uh, federal president, Richard von Weizsäcker, who in his incredible statement at the 40th anniversary of the end of the Second World War said, and I quote, it's not about overcoming the past. That is impossible. Past cannot be changed or unmade. But those who close their eyes to the past are blind of the future. Those who do not wish to remember the inhumane will once again be likely to suffer in the, in the present. And he said, as men, we aim for reconciliation. And it is because of that that we must understand there can be no reconciliation without remembrance. Memory creates hope, creates faith in redemption in the reunification of those who were separated. The last world war awakened in the hearts of men and women the desire for peace. It highly contributes to peace, not to expect, uh, not to wait for the other, but to approach the other. And I don't think there's anything else to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter, for your wonderful presentation. So we're going to carry on now. We are waiting for someone who comes from the same country as Walter. Stephanie is going to be connecting through Zoom. Can you hear me, Stephanie? Can you hear me well? Yes. From far away, welcome. Just a few notes on Stephanie. She's the director of the Research Center for Antisemitism at the Technical University of Berlin. She has published a very interesting book that gets deeper into the role of the Condor Legion in Spain, not only the military trajectory, but also in the day-to-day -day life here, how was the relationship with the um, Francoist um, army and also with the Spanish army that they train? And we think that uh, it is essential for her to participate in this conference. So without further ado, I would like to leave you with her on her presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your invitation. I would have loved to be in Madrid today, but we all know 
the reason why it's not possible for me to be there today. So I'm going to repeat some of the things that my estimated colleague Walter has already told you about, but I'm just going to do it with a German accent, so this is something new for you. And is the, she was t he was telling us about the, the destruction of a small Basque uh, city that was just the first one in a series of several other cities destroyed by the bombings of the general army in the subsequent year. This way of seeing Spain as a prelude of the Second World War combined the popular knowledge with a perspective that is common in German historiography that reduced normally the civil war in Spain as a training field for the German forces. So this interpretation, as Walter say, come from one of the people involved, Hermann Gurin, but we need to highlight that this was just a reason, an afterthought. It had nothing to do with the real political and economic reasons and uh, the, random and the randomness that ended up with the Nazi Germany being involved in the incipient, incipient civil war that we didn't know back then in July 1936 that it was going to be a long war. But I don't want to bore you with an, a topic uh, that you can read in uh, a great number of books. What I would like to talk about today is how the aerial war happened, and especially the bombing war, the German bombing war happened in Spanish ground, because once there, instead of transporting the troops through the Gibraltar Strait, the Germans knew how to exploit the Spanish experience to the full in, uh, at a technical, strategical, and psychological level. So uh, from the First World War, the horrors of the war, air war were part of uh, what's popular associated with terror. And since the Italian general Giulio Duet exposed his theory um, of the strategic aerial war in the 20s, uh, the specialists were debating whether it was possible to win a war exclusively from the air destroying cities infrastructure and the moral of the enemy. The Spanish Civil War was the first occasion to try in the practice the, valid, the validity of these theories and counter theories. And that's why the bombings, the trial of those involves and the development of the technique and the consequences on in soldiers and civil population was echoed in international media. These uh, reports um, were sending shivers on the spine of people all over Europe because or of after what because of after what was happening in Spain, even people away from the front could imagine themselves being a potential victim of a war to come. However, the great attention that attracted the bombings of uh, Spanish cities eclipsed until today the fact that from the military point of view, the most important was the use of uh, bombings as artillery from the air. The bombs were directly, mostly, and especially had a devastated effect on the enemy troops. And uh, in great battles like Brunete and Ebro, there were hundreds of thousands of dead people. The majority of aerial attacks against civil targets caused a number of victims that was relatively reduced. Unless, from our current perspective, looking at the n numbers that we saw were common in the Second World War. However, back then, especially from the perspective of an Andalusian laborer, um, a Basque farmer, or uh, working at the, in the Catalan docks, dying in the air, away from the front, and away from home was com something completely new. And that's why the attacks on the troops and on the civil population had a devastating psychological effect as confirmed by the information services of both sides with an uncommon unanimity. And I'm just going to quote a Republican report. The panic produced by aviation is huge, both for the civil 
population and army population. And of course, both the pilots and the military direction were aware of this, as was written by a German pilot, Max Hoyos. And I'm going to quote him, because tremendous fear to the population and him and the military direction order once and again to fly over the targets morally. This was this is a quote that come from German. So we're just gonna fly morally to reinforce the psychological effect of the attacks to provoke fear both to the civil population and soldiers was part of the strategy of the Francoist troops from the beginning. The fact that the big Republican cities like Bilbao, Barcelona or Valencia were not reduced to ashes despite that they could do it was because of the specific circumstances of the civil war, not the moral moderation of those involved. So all in all, between December 1936 and March 1937, the combat squads and the bombing squads, experimental bombing squads of the Condor Legion had between 1,000 and 1,200 missions in enemy ground. There were the flu in a chain formation. One of them came down after the other, uh, dropping the bombs so the people in the ground were under con constant uh, bombing and they were completely frozen if they could at all survive. And the bombers were attacking small towns and cities where the reserves and the general command of the enemy and um, where through what was called scatter attacks. The pilot Hoyos that was involved in them during the first phase of the war in Extremadura has described the consequences of this succession of bomb bombing call or the Germ what the German call a mix of general command. That's a quote from Hoyos. The most heaviest, the heaviest uh, bombs were destroying the clay huts. They didn't even have to hit the target in the midst of the dust they were turning, turning, down, turning down the small towns at the first attack. Those who remained from the general command flee. And we were launching, we were um, dropping shrapnel bombs until they stopped running so that they had no intention to coming back. In these places, the militia could hardly respond to these attacks. And a Republican soldiers described this remembering the last ditch attempt to defend themselves. We were laying on our backs and we were shooting them back with our old Mausers and our new Mexican rifles. We couldn't even bring one down, but we thought that maybe our shots could um, fly lower and they couldn't bombard us with precision. Seeing the numerous erratic bombings, maybe this hope was not in vain. But with all the small cities, but considering this, all the small cities were uh, an easier target than ships, streets, and bridges, and trams. That caused great problems for the Legion, especially at the beginning. This situation changed at the beginning, changed after the arrival of Wolfram von Richthofen to Spain, who was an engineer and that uh, was in charge of the experimental section of the Ministry of Aviation. And in Spain, um, he tried to try he tried to try the new models and weapons in the different operative tasks of the civil war. First of all, they analyzed the different type of constructions of the Spanish cities. They compared this to the normal Central European cities, and they thought that because of the type of constructions, um, the bombs that they have didn't work because the, the houses were very poor and they didn't, they couldn't do what they wanted to do. So the Germans could ex start their experiments in the midst of December because of the personal ambition of the command Capo de Llano who wanted to, to get all this area of um, olives near Porcuna. And he wrote this in his diary, to be able to drop our bombs in 
real cities are going to allow us to see the effects of the bombs because the towns are very close to the front and we are going to conquer them soon. So we are hoping to be able to examine this. So after Richthofen ordered the bombings of Buhalante, Montoro, and El Carpio in 14 December 1936. They could examine the consequences of the bombs from the air. And a week later, once the, the towns were taken, they could analyze these and they could dec dec document it with photographs. So the order by the Legion declared as an official objective to diminish the morale of the enemy forces of these little towns. But those involved knew that this was not, not the main aim. But Rich Hoffen himself wasn't sure. And then another quote from his diary, it's a peculiar sensation to see for the first time, seeing how bombs drop on people and real targets. They leave the plane almost peacefully, almost like playing, and you're aware that down there, peace will stop sin. Who will the bomb reach? Simple people, they don't really want to know anything about white and red. The reason is the olive crops that Capo wants. That's what we're gonna do. And we do this, we do our duty if our bombs hit the targets that they signal. So this call to duty and the orders um, initially um, dissipated the doubts of having attacked also the civil population. In other quotes from the diary of Richard, Often we can see that in 14th of December there were 120 bombs of 50 kilos each only in Bujalante. In the attack, 120 people died, and citizens from the town and soldiers, and there were numerous casualties and, and in, injured uh, people. So the absence of shelter was the cause of this high number of casualties. A bit after, a pilot called, called Hans Tr Trotloft and um, visit the towns destroyed near Cordoba. And I quote, almost all the towns have been destroyed. There is just uh, some ruins. The situation of vigilance is especially terrible. There are no houses left, just a few isolated ones, as if a mad person had caused chaos with, with a an axe. You can see such a distraction elsewhere. Only people isolated, all old men and women, and that they didn't want to leave their homes where they have spent their lives. They were walking around in the ruins like shadows. So, despite this. In December 1936, while a, hundred, a few hundred kilometers of a sp small Andalusian cities were reduced to ashes without the public opinion knowing this, the interests of national and international media concentrated on the Spanish capital. At the beginning, the Germans were only launching, uh, dropping leaflets on Madrid, where Franco announced explicitly that they will, he would destroy the city if there was no rendition. And the intervention from uh, Germany and the, because of the perspective of, of a European or a future European war, take us that at, take that at the end of the summer 1936, there was fear in the civil population. In the mid, middle in, of November, the Legion Condor started the systematic bombardment of the Spanish capital. And it was the first example of a strategic bombardment. Their purpose was to um, break the resistance of the population, as admitted by Alfredo Kindelan and the commander Sperle. This was not as easy for the German pilots. And there was always a Spanish pilot accompanying them to identify the building. The but whether 
and the first casualties, and finally the great failure get, got together. So the um, they were the pilots, the German pilots were not in good spirits. In Avila, an English journalist could hear how a German official could shout the orders on the phone. Until today, they were discussing if they tried to use all their weapons or that they contained themselves because of the symbolic relevance of the capital and the uh, attraction of the public, world public opinion. But bombs were enough to kill several thousands of people and to force thousands to stay right next to the entry of the metro and to place the city at the edge of collapse. So in the reports of the different journalists, you could see the horror reflected. And only the reporter of Basler Nash Richten was thinking about more modest words to describe how the vision of destroyed men, women and children had created immense sadness to him. Those who did not follow the theory of the air war of duet were satisfied because Madrid had demonstrated that it was not possible to win a war against the city only from the air. But the North Offensive that started in the 31st of March and the Germans uh, had, again, influence in planning, proved that the aerial support was decisive also in the ground. So the ground troops were still under the command of General Mola, and all the aerial forces, including the Italian and Spanish, were under the command of the German commander that responded to or reported to Franco or looking at which Hoffen words, it was the first time we are, we are commanding the whole thing without having a real responsibility, end of quote. So this was going to happen without taking into account the civil population. As happened to me in Madrid, as happened in Madrid, the demoralization was part of the strategy, especially because Franco considered the bombing of Republican cities as a patriotic duty, and they wanted, and Mola wanted to deindustrialize other cities. So, according to Mola, the sanitizing of Spain was only possible distracting the Catalan and Basque industrial centers, but Richard Hoffen thought that it was something silly. So for him, the, the idea of destroying something that you would like to take over later is new. But he still carried on communicating the threats in that is as a part of psychological and military strategy, announcing the perverse Basque people that they had the, me the, me the sources to destroy Bilbao and to destroy all of Vizcaya. So a travel report sent to different German departments includes the following targets of the North strategic missions. So they are weapon factories, ports and docks, food deposits, and attacks that cause terror to pressure, put pressure on negotiations. So before the, this offensive, we already had the rhetoric foundations. So this allowed the Germans to continue with the experimental bombardments that they started in Andalusia and carry on this in a city or in a place where the type of construction was similar, I quote, to that in the small cities that of the countries that are nearby, Poland, Belgium, and Holland.
They can move fast, so the effects of the bombs could be analyzed and documented a bit after the attack. And even though this attack was not to terrorize the population, and that was the effect of the bombing of Guernica, because of the echo in the media, this helped enormously the conquest of Bilbao and all of the north. So a year later, the apocalyptic images of Guernica and Gijón were repeated in the last great offensive of the Republicans in the Ebro. For them, the combat squads of the Legion had perfectioned their procedures, and they were dropping thousands of bombs in uninterrupted attacks over the enemy. So the psychological effects of these have been described by the Republican Luis Mezquida. While some went in apathy, those who heard the run run of the um, engines were running nervously, trying to, to protect themselves. Nerves and panic to cover the soldiers, and they were shouting at each other. because this is what will attract the attention on the group. But on the German side, there were a lot of pic pictures that document in detail the effects caused by bombs in the Ebro and the southern towns like Ares de Mestre, Albocácer, or Benazal. And I recommend you the documentary of my friends Pepe, Andrew, and Rafa Moles that you're going to see in the afternoon and that deals with these bombings that uh, we haven't known about for de decades. Another chapter that hasn't been studied in the civil, in the war of Spain was the strategic, purely strategic activity of the Condor Legion when they were bombed to electric and water in, infrastructure in the Mediterranean coast. They damaged infrastructure, but also the morale of the population in nearby cities, where the naval aviation squad installed themselves in Mallorca in the summer of 1937. The Germans developed what an official call a very dangerous recipe, but with a decisive strategic importance. They perfected a uh, attack strategy that at the beginning of 1938 took the population of the cities in the coast to a situation of fear and permanent threat. In the coast, they called the pilots because at the same time, every night, they come from the sea to the railways to bombard and destroy the transport trains of the Reds which were defenseless. Together with the Italians, their bombers went all through the Mediterranean coast from Cartagena until Porbo. And they did not only attack trains, but also what they thought it was a profitable um, target, like um, ports, ships, bridges, railways, transports, or cars, caravan or cars. The proof they proved and, and demonstrated and notated uh, different attacks and techniques. You can see in these documents how to destroy a road permanently or how to attack a train or train or attack attacks on so and so. So the rest of the German and Italian squads supported the national army in their march towards Barcelona at the end as a Official, German officials said there were no station on the way between Barcelona and Valencia. All the trains were devastated. A really impressive image. So for those who inhabit the coast, the scenario was completely different. Not only the military objective, but also the cities were attacked over and over again because they have a port or because the general command was staying there. 
So the, look, for example, the small town of Pereyo was comple almost completely destroyed in three attacks in December 1938, and the number of casualties was very low because the population had been evacuated after the first attack. And the population of Colera, a bit to the north, they had to take food supplies because the bridge near the city, one of the main targets of the campaign, was never hit. But the houses were hit. And there were jokes during the colleagues that maybe we should destroy the bridge so that Germans can leave them in peace. But jokes aside, the lack of sleep and the constant uncertainty uncertainties made them tired. And the night attacks are the ones that people remember the most. And the constant fear of bombs was bigger than the actual damage. And we should add to this the hunger and the sadness because of the catastrophe that was unfolding. And cities like Tarragona didn't have enough shelters, seeing that the rhythm of work, they wouldn't be ready even in the year 2000. That's what the um, newspaper, Diari de Tarragona, said in the summer of 1937. And even when there were no casualties or in injuries, the attack of Blans in Blanes in the 10th of October 1938 had dramatic consequences. And I quote, the terror is produced by the noise of the engine when the plane flies over your home after a terrible explosion. When planes constantly flying over the town, this is how the air goes, like German call them, force the population go into the mountains. As someone from reported from the Daily Telegraph said, and I quote, the horror of that time is in the minds of the population. A sad caravan go to the hills around the city. About 50% of the 100,000 inhabitants of Almeria sleep outside of the city most of the time, most in open air. From 7 and 8 in the morning, I have seen them coming back with their pillows and their sheets. And the population from Tarragona, Tortosa, and Granollers and Girona had to fly to the mountains. And in these cities, life stopped. And the demoralization of the population was was moving as fast as the core Marocchi. And the bombings in Catalonia ended the lives of 4,376 people. And the last attack was in Figueres. And they were trying. Stephanie, can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. We need you to end your presentation because you're going over the time allocated to you. Let's see how I can finish this. The important thing is to understand strategically the panic is a way to collapse a big city. And I would like to mention the example of Barcelona. And to collapse a city morally is also what wins the war. This is really the conclusion of my presentation. And there is a quote from a German official who had taken part in a lot of discussions of the command. And in 1937, he wrote, poor Spain, in case of this history ending one day, there won't be much left out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And we're going to continue now with the 
professor of the University Complutense, big expert of the history of photography in our country, has several PhDs, and he's going to talk to us about the dead birds. Thank you, Jose Mari. Thank you to everyone. It is a pleasure to collaborate in this event. And I'm going to do this by making a slight turn, just a slight turn to speak about those who suffered the bombings. And I'm going to do that from the verses of those who, the poems of those who suffered. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the speakers. It's a great, they are a top level and uh, Everything, uh, so I'm not an expert, everything is really interesting. If you allow, over the first few months of the year 37, Juan Sanchez Tabuada, born in the Al Calle Almanza on the 7th of March 1949, was evacuated from Madrid after suffering the first bombings and sent to Murcia. Just a few months later, Maria Luisa de Gil Fernández, born in the Tiros Vanjas Street in Tetuan on the 30th of September 1934, had to flee with her family, brothers, siblings, and uh, parents. In the case of Juan Sánchez, he was always to return to Madrid after the war. Maria Luisa de Gil didn't come back until she was 18, having lost all her family. She had been adopted by her family in that Catalan village. There is so much criticized and that took on so many people from Madrid. And when she came back, she had no family here. She lived a domestic exile. Those two people are my parents. And I wish to dedicate this text I'm going to read because they were the children of the war. The review of the printed press edited during the Civil War. Can you hear me? I think you can't hear me anymore. Can you hear me? I am sorry. I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Hello. Yes, thank you. I was saying that uh, looking at the printed press during the Spanish Civil War, leads to still a lot of distress. When we read it, the, that time takes us back to a far sordid world, but it reflects to a certain extent the current way of living. This uh, contribution is not more than a grain of sand to reivindicate the word against bombs. This parad paradigm of the verses of Vicente Alexander author of the most beautiful and sad ode to memory of the children died in the bombings. To know how to write. Literature and photography are fragile, like the breath of the expression of those that consider the soul, and they waste 21 grams. They are tools against weapons, and that's why verses as bombs collect the answer of poets to the Civil War barbaric. Or to the, what the graphic Alfonso Sánchez uh, Portela reporter state, Alberto Carpentier in the book uh, Chronics of Spain 1925-1937 wrote in during the Second International Conference of Writers for the Defense of Culture held in 1937 in Valencia, Madrid, Barcelona, and also in Paris. And he wrote in that conference that a lady came to him, an old lady, and said to him when he was talking to his friends during that meeting, and the old lady said to him, please do defend us, you who know how to write. How dangerous it is to know how to write, so much so that poets have always been feared, not just because they don't understand, we don't understand their feelings, but because of envy, because we can never reach, not even with power, the future of their words. Because they knew how to write, Lorca and Martado were killed. One of them, Young, killed, shot in a cliff, and the others alone, sad, in the exilium of Coyura. Also, Miguel Hernández, to whom Vicente Alexander protected. Uh, to be able 
because of the writing, so died Gerda Taro in Brunette and Robert Kalp after leaving the poem of uh, the Peroncelli Street, a single verse in his large narrative and poem volume. But also Campia uh, died because of the collecting the memories of the first third of the 20th century of Julio Duque because of writing to the Daily ABC. With the Fountain Pain and Light uh, wrote the foreign correspondents, one of them Henry Buckley, who was in Madrid since 1929 and narrated in Life and Death of the Spanish Republic the first bombings of the capital in November 1936. And he wrote, they started to throw bombs of 500 and if there are even a thousand kilograms that fell on the city and suburbs of the city. I remember that on the night of 17th, the low clouds offered a similar protection against air attacks. Suddenly we heard the noise of a bomb that came towards us. It was nine o'clock at night, over five hours. There was no time to rest. The fire bombs illuminated the skies of Madrid that was on fire. After exploding on the roof, they let their liquid calcium load that produced a white flame on the wall. It's impossible to know how many people died those days in Madrid. The authorities could not give a figure because that was a war secret. The only way to know the truth was to go every morning to the corpse, um, to the to the area where the dead people were left and look and every night we could say that at least a thousand people died in that month victims of bombings in Spain. Those words I've just read were corroborated at the end of the 80s last century by my dad when I asked him about the war. Although my dad always mentioned about the fact that it happened before and put it on the scale and was the arrest and death of a young seminarist that uh, taught him to read together with the with other children in Cuatro Caminos. The Hispanic Sergei Salain in La Poesía de la Guerra de España stresses that there were more than 15,000 narrative poems published in thousands of uh, newspapers during the Civil War, and they talked about the bombings that were never casual. They were planned in order to create fear. The scars of a shrapnel, shrapnel in the walls in Vallecas, uh, in the south was an emblem, an icon, a black spot to delete from the maps, like many other places in Sp Spanish history that have already been mentioned here. The Argentinian intellectual Maria Luisa Carnele, writer, journalist, and a uh, writer of tangos, wrote uh, poems to Cuatro Caminos, Vallecas, Ventas, and Puente de Segovia are collected in El Resumen General de la Guerra de España. And one to Vallecas, she wrote, Vallecas, Puente Vallecas, shot and broken its humble houses, cistern courtyard and vineyard. The cannon breaks their walls. It could break even more. And just as Vallecas, the village of uh, Getafe, close to which 50 children died on the 30th of October 1936, it's already been mentioned here, and they have shown the terrible, terrible pictures. Arturo Varea, in charge of the censorship in the press office, had in its hands the pictures of the kids died that died in the morgue, and said with broken, uh, with close eyes and broken lips as if they were asleep. A week later, on the 6th of November, he looked at the images in his office again. The Franco troops were about to enter Madrid, and his boss proposed to kill, to um, burn them, just in case of being convicted. But he kept them because, and he writes, I didn't want those poor children to be abandoned again. Afterwards, he gave the photographs and the contacts to Antonio Mije, who used them in the Republican posters that we've already seen. A selection was also reproduced in Humanité on the 8th of November. This is very well told by Amanda Val in the book Hotel Florida. Vicente Alexander. The literature on the bombing of the capital has a paradigm for me, the ode to the children of dead 
uh, Ode to the Dead Children in Madrid, uh, was written by him when he was 38. And uh, he had the sensitivity of a man injured by the dead children. And he included a lyric uh, ode. Also, those who fell on the street but in Tholi, uh, whose cracks can still be seen in the verses as bombs. In the, the, the house of Pironcelli is now close to one of Bellintonia, close to Ciudad Universitaria, sanctuary of the poet. Alexander had two problems to survive the war. First, his social status. He was considered a little sir by the anarchist, and on the other, homosexuality perverted by the fascist. Four years before the war started, on the 19th of June, 1932, he was, uh, his right kidney was extirpated during his convalescence. His uh, lover, Andres Acero, was with him, as well as his friends, especially Damaso Alonso and García Lorca. Then Rafael Alberti, Luis Cernuda, Gerardo Diego, Miguel Hernández, and José Antonio Muñoz Rojas would add to him. Of many of them, he left. Um, signed in the book Los Encuentros, edited in 1958. In October 1936, the house of the poet was searched in order to find evidence with which to link him to those that committed the coup d'etat. Then it was destroyed because it was too close to the front, and he had to go and move to his uncle's Agustin, uh, number 16 of the street Españoleto. A month later, in November, he was arrested by an uncontrollable group of militians, and he was put in a prison for 24 hours. The intervention of Pablo Neruda saved him from his death. And to that, Alexander responded with verses. And he w it was exactly then that he had the metaphor of referring to planes as the, as the um, birds of death, birds and death, opposing words. And those uh, birds were the tool to lead to fear. And on the 18th of November, the foreign diplomacy talked about the barbarian of the bombings against the civilians. According to the biographer Alexander Daniel Colaran, the Ode to Dead Children was published in Mundo Obrero on the 19th of November, 19th of November 1936. Then the Daily Hour on the January 1937, and that same year, the book of Nandi Cunac, Le Poème du Monde du Fondant Le Peuple Espagnol, reviewed um, the poem with four pictures without a signature of two injured children and another one dead and a destroyed house with its inhabitants on the door accompanied by a soldier. And also the typography is diluted amongst the incredible words. Spain exported the terror but also the verses against hate. And I'm now going to read the ode to the dead children of Madrid by Vicente Alexander. We do not have uh, the translation, so we're just having a um, free version of the poem. Poor women can be seen running in the streets like lamps or fright in the fog. The houses are collapsed, the broken houses splattered with blood. The rooms where a scream was felt trembling, where nothingless suddenly exploded, livid dust of floating walls. The ghosts are ghostly past death. They are the dark houses where children died. Look at them like segments. They opened in the night under the terrible light. Children slept white in their darkness. Children born with the rumor of life. Children or soft bodies offered, who winds hush rested. The women run. Blood splashed through the windows. Who saw, who saw a little arm get out broken in the night with light of blood or stabbed star? Who saw the child's blood in a thousand drops screaming, crime, crime? raised to the heavens like an immense clamorous fist. Small faces, the cheeks, the breasts, the innocent belly that breathes. The shrapnel seeks them, the shrapnel, the sudden serpent, starry death for their martyrdom, rivers of dead children. Go looking for a final destination, a light, high world. The stinking beds of dead airplanes, airplanes, engines, dark vultures whose plumage encloses the destruction of beating flesh, the horrible death in pieces that palpitates and that voice of the victims, broken throats bursting through the city like a moan. We all heard it. The children have cried out. Their voice is ringing out. Can you hear it? 
It sounds in the dark. It sounds in the light. It sounds in the streets. All the houses scream. You pass by, and out of that broken window comes a scream of death. You go out. Get out of that doorless hall. A blood comes, blood comes out and screams. The windows, the doors, the towers, the roofs, they scream, they scream. The children who died for the city feel it. Little hearts, their chests, broken faces. Don't look at them, hear them. Through the city, a river of grief cries out and calls. It rises and rises and calls out to us. The flooded city rises through the roofs and raises a terrible arm, a single arm. Heroic mutilation of the city in its chest. A clamorous fist, red with free blood, that the city wields, wrathful and shooting. This was written by Vicente Alexander after the bombing of Getafe, and he was nearly fusillated in a prison for that. This is the Spanish Civil War. A month later, uh, the odd of dead, deadly um, birds came back to Vallecas. In, on the 18th of uh, September, it was published. The effect caused on the enemy has been seen in the bombings done uh, the other day by some rebels in some areas of the uh, city in Barrio de California and Barrio de Vallecas. The number of uh, people dead caused by the bombs is the price of the civilians for defending uh, also the front lines. That same year, due to the bad, uh, well, to the problems with food uh, safety. He had a problem on his kidney, and his uh, fragility started. And he added to this uh, pain, the real pain, of because of all those dead children. And although he was not able to avoid the death in, his, in prison, he sent money to Josefina, the wife of Miguel, so that her and her children could uh, overcome the problems. Other bombs all the verses. I was saying at the beginning that I wanted to talk about the before, the during, and the current, a little bit also about current times, because we're talking about fighting terror. Those events have been reproduced and were reproduced without problem. The law is no longer respected or it no longer serves. And Spain exported the terror of aerial bombings to Europe and the tragedy continued uh, globally. And at the same time, it was the genesis of printed verses with blood ink. We unbury the complaint, what Alexander said to disseminate it. Civilian population of half of the world were, are now immersed in terror. Let's think of Syria of which a correspondent of El Mundo wrote on the 30th of September 2015. The Russian bombings this Wednesday led to at least 36 more uh, victims, and they have uh, targets uh, where the Islamic State and the uh, brigades linked to al-Qaeda are not present. Yesterday, in fact, today, Palestine, and anywhere else in the world. In any of those areas of the world, children continue to die. Guilty, the one who gives the order and the one who executes. And for each death, I bring a verse. And I bring some uh, a poem, an Arab poem of the Arab Franco and French-speaking Miran El 28 injuries. I was smaller than a very small girl when I knew that life was a wound. I didn't look at my identity card. I didn't look at my face in the mirror along the river. Each wound told me the age of my life. Six little sores uh, filed on the dirt road between my grandfather's house and the school made of a room and a window far from my family in Aleppo. I filed 20 wounds with my tears falling on the road to Aleppo, the distant city, my father's grave. 28 wounds engraved with a love in the air in Juan Miro's postcard on your fore forehead and in faraway cities. There's only one I cannot file and then I hide like a talisman for my death, the wound of poetry. Uh, I was sent a magician by Khaled e. Suleiman El Nasseri, and with this I finish. She was not a magician, the one who sprayed sleep dust on children to make them sleep. Maybe it wasn't even sleep dust. Maybe even the children weren't even asleep. Maybe they were just cheating to make them sleepy. Some little kids went out to play. They came back with the marks from their, uh, uh, from their garments on them. 
On another uh, street, a child wanted to go to war, but, and he fought with his shadow, and his shadow came home alone. In another street, the neighbor's son has sent from the window of his room a kiss to his neighbor's daughter, who was peeping from the window across the street. The sniper hit the target. A house sitting on the shoulder of the river, a family gathered at night. In the river, the blood has passed and has not yet turned to water. The family knew that the blood was the son's blood, blood of the music that emerged. I think that Spain exported aerial terror to Europe, to the world, but we also export verses like, like bombs, uh, even better against the bombs. We could say maybe this text has been a digression, but I think it has given, I think I needed to give a few words to the unknown but not forgotten dead children. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Miguel, for your presentation. You have sh shown us what we were saying at the beginning of the conference, that time is a continuum. And this beautiful link between these two buildings that you mentioned that Madrid is trying to defend, and we're still fighting for it to happen. One Peronceli, we have already saved the building, and the other one is the house of Vicente Alexander, a Nobel Prize. And because time is a continuum, this last block that is going to close the morning session is going to show us how we, we still have some remains alive. We have here the armed forces. And I'm trying to say that word. Thank you very much for helping me desactivating the bombs from the past. We would like to thank the General Directorate of the National Police and also the Civil Guards for accepting our invitation in the framework of this conference to talk about this continuum in time, how this past is present, is still here. There are bombs still that keep on showing up. And this is one of the blocks that a lot of people are interested in. First of all, we're going to have Angel Carlos Rodriguez Martinez. He's a brigade for the civil guards, and he trains in desactivating explosives in and defense. And, and without further ado, I'm just going to give the floor to him, and let's listen to you. When we received the invitation, in our department, and my boss told me if I wanted to come here. First of all, I wasn't sure what we could talk about, because our approach to this issue is very different. We, our approach to weapons in general, and especially aviation bombs, which is the main topic of this conference, we approached it in a different way. We uh, value and understand and we can appreciate the historic value that they have and the historic research that can be done, but this is not our work. We don't look at them from a historic point of view. But because of how attractive this topic is, 
some of our colleagues without reaching the level of what we have been listening so far, they have research this topic deep, deeper. And some people, some of my colleagues, when they find some of the weapons, they tell me the name of the pilot who did the bombing and everything. But this is an exception. So our approach to this uh, topic is just merely technical. And I'm just going to just summarize it because of the time allocation that I have for my presentation. But our worry as a, pol as a uh, police force, our worry is the security in the population. These weapons are still there, after, surprisingly, after 80 years. Some of the weapons are intact. And we don't tend to deactivate these weapons. Contrary to popular belief, what we do is a control explosion, if the place allows for that to happen. So is a control distractions. And so our approach to weapons is technical to see how they work and the potential dangers involved. And sometimes we approach the weapon, we destroy it if the place where they appear allow us to do so. And if not, we can do a deactivation without knowing sometimes who dropped those bombs. So there is no doubt in some of them, because we know that they came from the Germans or Italians. But in some others, because uh, they are the remains of the First World War or the other European remains. They belong to one command or the other, and they could be dropped by either of them. So as I was saying at the beginning, when I thought about how to approach my presentation, I thought that it was inevitable to explain a little bit about our service and how we deploy this in Spain so that you can see the problems that we face as civil guards. Uh, it's probably different to uh, the problems faced by the national police. Uh, my colleague, who is going to do his presentation after me. And in the end, we get a statistic. It's a very dense statistic. But sorry to disappoint you, but we don't have it classified as civil war or non-civil war. We have a statistic. It was a German, it was an aviation bomb, etc., etc. But to get to know exactly the percentage that belongs to the civil war, you have to get into more than 30,000 documents that we have. So the percentage, more or less of 100, is civil wars. But I, would, I, would, I wanted to clarify that the statistic that we have, we don't di differentiate. There are special cases like the aviation bombs. Uh, the percentage is close to 100. It's very difficult that we have a, one bomb that is not from the civil war. But with other types of weapons, there were training camps from the army, from the artillery. And now where they were is a natural park. And we can find still some weapons from the 40s or even from the 50s. What I wanted to say was that if in Spain we have modern weapons, it's the army who deals with it. 
So if there is a modern, a modern weapon that we don't know why, but it just came about, is the army who deals with it. If we are the ones in charge, then they will tell us and we will act on it. But if it's us who discover it and it's not you know, the realm of our um, competence, then we will um, call the army. So we were in charge of these weapons because of what I was saying before, uh, because of protecting the security of the citizens, for example, people running in the woods or people um, looking for saps. And this, of course, involves a problem of security for the population. And we have been doing it um, in the recent times. And before then, it was the army who was in charge of this. After civil war, the population had to learn about this. They were familiar with these type of things. And so they were keeping hand grenades in their homes, artillery. And these people grow older, and then their daughters and sons, when they go to the house in the town and they're going to do some renovation in the house or something, they find it. And then we go there and take care of these weapons. And in some cases, because of their own fear, they just leave it in strange places next to a trail for, and you, th you think, how could they abandon this for 80 years in the middle of the trail where everyone can see it? Yeah, we, we see things that are there in the middle of the trail. So this is the reason why we are in charge of this. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the service that we provide and how we approach, uh, approach this issue. At the, in the end, I have taken some pictures of weapons that we have found, but uh, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time. I don't think it's the most interesting thing, but if I have time, I will put it. So as the, a service to deactivate explosive devices, we were thinking of the need in the 70s because of the uh, terrorist activity. We were created differently to other units in Europe. Yesterday, I was seeing a report on the TV of a Polish unit that belonged to the army. I was dedicated exclusively to deal with the great amount of ammunition after the Second World War bombings. But in our case, we're just a police force. And because we have to face to the terrorism that we have in Spain, there was a need to fight uh, this um, explosive planted by the ban ETA and other terrorist groups. So we asked the army, the artillery personnel, they were familiar with this type of deactivation. And learning from them and adapting their techniques to the deactivation of explosive devices, but improvised explosive devices from terrorist group, that's when we created in the 70s the first courses, training courses provided by the uh, Spanish army. And in 1979, we created the service itself. It was a department back then, and then it became a service. And in the year 1982, we created the school, the training school, to deactivate, as I was saying, explosive devices. Then the department turned into a service, as I said, and after the terrorist attacks of September the 11th, 
In the U.S., we had the problem of the international terrorist attacks, and from the 2000, the year 2000, we dedicated a lot of resources and time to the training in BRQ, and we went in. And BRQ, and we went into the army. They had training in this matter, and we created our own procedures, adapted it to the problems that we have, which is the pol police problems. So we approved this defense system and nuclear, radiological, and biological weapon army, and. This is now part of our service, and the, this uh, deactivation of explosive devices recognizes this in all situations. The mission is to detect and execute the tasks of the activation of weapons. So the study and analysis of the deactivation techniques, we have an office that dedicates itself exclusively to this. And I have gone to the office so that they can give me the statistics, data that I'm going to show here. And it's an office that is uh, dedicated to studying and analyze the deactivation techniques. Their main efforts are deactivating these explosive devices and protecting the population. So any explosive device that we work with, in, we create a document and we share this with the rest of the civil guard departments. And also, we have a very close collaboration with the national police. And any day activation of work, there is an honest change of information. We generate uh, documentation. And the same with all the ammunition that we find. We generate a document. And this document ends in this office that I was telling you about. But the treatment of the document, as opposed to the document generated by a uh, crime, related to terrorism or not, this document is not worked on. It goes to the statistics. We archive it physically before. Now we do it digitally. And we don't re-elaborate the document. We don't add any amendments to it, we don't create a new document. Yeah, unless it's a case of, as I was saying, terrorism or just common crimes. In this case, we re-elaborate or recreate the document. So this is the organization, as I was uh, saying. There are different departments, the school where I belong, and there is a deployment, which is uh, national. In the school, we have different courses. I'm not just not going to mention all of them. But we have different collaborations nowadays. We collaborate with the OEA. We have courses on radiological security. And they belong to the, this school. Uh, and these courses are in our school of Valdemoro. The deployment, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. But the deployment, as I was saying, as, as you can see here, is national. But we are not in big cities. I have been listening to other presentations. But in the city of Madrid, we don't have competence in the city of Madrid. This is the national police is in charge, and everything to do with explosive artifacts or ammunition that can appear is the national police. In Brunete and Jarama, we are in charge of those areas, and we have also this all across Spain. 
As you can see here, the statistic, we're talking about up to the date in which I asked the, my colleagues in the office, we have about 3,000 interventions with ammunition. They're not all in the civil um, war. I'm just going to tell you about the different types of ammunition in aviation bombs is about 100, as I was saying. In other types of ammunition, maybe it's not close to 100, but 90-something 90 90 something percent belong to the civil war. I have been working for 25 years as a TEDx specialist in the activation of devices. And I have done about four or five when it comes to ammunition. It depends when you normally work, as I was saying before. Maybe there is a training field or something, and now it's a natural park, and you can see that there are more things appearing, but this is uh, not usual. And briefly, we can do small explosions. There was a case in Albacete that um, was rescuing the, a small kid that fell into a hole in the ground and other cases. And then in the province of Teruel, we have another case. And also, we have a case with an speleologist. We tried to rescue him. And so these have been a few interesting cases that we have dealt with. But getting into the great wall of numbers, so we have uh, the conventional devices that we have dealt with. According to our office, it's about 36,895. I'm going to zoom in the screen. We have several artifacts. As you can see here, and you see all the numbers of the different devices. As I was saying, these are some data for some specific devices. We were working on this not long ago. We didn't start with it work right after the war. We started working in the 90s almost. So surprisingly, these are the data. Imagine the ground army having this statistic in such detail like we do. Getting to the document itself takes longer, but these are the numbers. So 13,000 shrapnel, hand grenades, etc., mortars. You see all the numbers there. So just playing a bit with the numbers. So artillery. Shells, artillery shells. We, these are the teams that have had the most work. So, in Teruel, are the ones that have been working more on this. Madrid is not the capital. As I was saying, is the province of Madrid. It's not the capital of Madrid, and it's not some of the big cities around Madrid. Leganés, Getafe, Móstoles, Fuenlabrada, Alcalá de Henares, all the big cities. It's the pol national police who is in charge of all these big cities. We, as I was saying, we are deal with the small towns and the countryside. So from the 1985 to 1999, we have data from 1985, but in a systematic way from 1999. So not long ago, really, relatively. So in Teruel from 1989, Lerida 
1989 as well. From in Castellón, since 1985 in Zaragoza, since 1986 we have some data, loose data, and in a systematic way from 1989. Not long ago, as I was saying. So this is just a picture from the team in Zaragoza. This is a shell of 260 millimeters in Egea in Zaragoza, and these were the works to destroy it to, for a control explosion. This is what we do in these type of shells, projectiles. We know the internal structure, but if we can do it, if they tell us we can do it, then we find a way to do it. And we, what we do is a controlled destruction of the projectile. And we have hand grenades. As you can see here, in Asturias and Leon, the, this issue is uh, quite interesting, as I was saying at the beginning. Every summer, Every summer when they are renovating the houses from their grandfathers, etc., they call us saying that there are some hand grenades in the house, some of them in the current, uh, in the old packaging. We have had several generations that are very familiar with this type of weapons they are not familiar with an aviation bomb, but they are familiar with these hand grenades. And uh, this is very common, as I was saying, in Asturias and other areas like León. And also in Valencia, and Teruel, and Tarragona, Pontevedra, in the places, in these places, and also we have data since 1985 in Girona from 1985 and some data and then systematically from later on. We were working in the 90s, but then from the year 2000, I don't know exactly, you could see in the statistics, our work volume went down, not because there were less artifacts, but in Catalonia and the Basque country, they are in charge of this. And they have also their own teams of deactivation of explosives. So the majority of the cases are dealt with by the Mossos de Squadra and the Air China. And if the citizen call us, we go. But if not, there are other forces that are in charge of this in these um, places. In mortar shells, we have the highest numbers in Teruel. I'm going to tell you an interesting case that we have in Teruel. These are data from the 90s, 1990. It's not long ago, as I was saying. And in Teruel, we have been working on one 1,106 mortar shells in team in Zaragoza. They're in charge of Teruel and Huesca. They have worked on 1,611 since we have data. Our colleagues are very precise, and these are the data that we have and in the three provinces of Aragon, dealt by the team in Zaragoza, Teruel is the one that has the highest number. And this is the interesting case I was telling you about, and I thought it was interesting, so I thought of showing it to you. So in the year 2017, they were looking for an old um, person who had disappeared. And they found some mortal tails in these ponds in the river Hiroka. They called it the activation um, service. 
We have an underwater deactivation service, and they told us that they have seen several mortar tails. This is Monreal del Campo, near, very near Teruel. And the colleague was quite right. He saw between 12 and 15, and we ended up deactivating 243. So three days of constant diving. The pond wasn't very deep. It was about four meters. But it is in the river. And we thought, well, we think that there is still something left there because the density of the underwater didn't allow the diver to keep on coming down. The diver kept on coming, putting their hand down and was touching sun. He thought that he was touching the bottom. But in other places, he, he couldn't go farther down. So we got 500, so there were 543, and there could be some more. How they got there, we don't know. Um, they didn't drop them. They were in. It wasn't an attack. They weren't doing an attack with this. They were probably abandoning their position. That's what we think. They were abandoning their position, and that's why it happened. We're not going to leave this to the enemy. Because if we leave it, then they will use it. So it was a way for the enemy not to have it. This is where we found it. These are some of them. These adhesive mortars. And so taking out 543, this is the work. And this is the how they look. They were stuck to the bottom. So all these mortars were destroyed. To destroy this, what we do is we put a bit of explosive in them to unleash the explosive within the projectile. So we did all of them. And to end this with the aviation bombs, we can see here Teruel, Tarragona, Zaragoza, Madrid. I insist we are not in charge of the city of Madrid, and we don't work in big, the big metropolitan cities of Madrid. And as you can see, Asturias, Cantabria, Castellón. And I'm going to end with some examples. These are from Madrid. These pictures, I ask for them to different teams. Just send me some pictures of the most significant work you're doing. These are bombs from the German aviation in the Brunette Front, incendiary bombs also from the Brunette Front. This is a Russian bomb from the Brunette Front as well, near Naval Carnero. These are also Russian bombs. These are very interesting because they were made with modi modified artillery pro projectiles or shells in front of Brunetti as well. This is another Russian bomb that appeared in the Harama front. We're talking about 2014, and it was in the water, as you can see here. You can see it here. And something more interesting in a SD-250, it was in a house. Uh, they were doing some renovation, and they found it there. And we had to do some work to um, take it out. In the area of Zaragoza, the colleagues have sent me these pictures. This is also an interesting one, a uh, projectile. 114, 4 millimeter is a Russian one. And they have work also on English bombs like this one here, from Zuera, Zaragoza, to also appear in a renovation and bombs of 500 kilos. Like in this picture, the image is not very good, 
that is very significant and that's why I wanted to add it to the presentation. This was also done by the Zaragoza team. He got it out of hand a little bit and there was a glass broken in several kilometers around the area. We had taken all the necessary measures to make a big hole, but in the end, the explosive went. And the shock wave was big. We try and we take all the necessary security measures. So that it doesn't explode the shard. It can get set, set itself on fire, etc. And we can control the effects. And the team in Burgos sent us these ones. This one is from 1995 in Montija, in Burgos. It's an Italian one. And in the year 2000, nearby, in Merindad, in Montija, in Burgos as well, another one from the Legion, and this one from the 20, 2008, also in the same area, Montija. And they have all appeared very near the river. This is the river Erneja, next to the bridge that appears in the picture. And it had been there for over 80 years. Maybe people thought that it was a rock. And in Alicante, as the other speakers have said, there were lots of uh, bombings. And there are a lot of them underwater. So some divers maybe can accidentally find them. In the old town, in Segorbe, in Castellón, there was another German bomb. And this is in Madrid, one of the last ones that we, uh, the, our service has worked on in Lupiana, in Guadalajara. It's also a German bomb. And I would like to conclude with Hispania H5. This one is, this one is, could be from either front. So they belong to the Spanish army uh, at the beginning of the war. German bombs here too, in the Nora River. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Angel, for your presentation. I don't think he has been disappointed. I, disappointing, sorry, and I think it shows very clearly the, how all these devices are still present. And also today, there are experts who fortunately are in our police forces and that are still risking their lives when they have to fuse this devices. And now we're going to hear to the presentation by Francisco Javier Fernández Ortega. He's, he joined the police in the 80s, the police force, and he works at the TEDx, the explosive unit. He is an expert on this, and he's going to talk about the role of the police officers in the diffusing of the bombs. Just one sec. Let me just put the presentation. Sí, he traído uno con una sola. Es una verdad, pero no. Él está abriendo la hora.
Si quieren, repito la de Guardia Civil. If you want, I can just repeat the presentation uh, carried out by the civil government. Sí, está. Hasta que lo tenemos. You go half an hour. Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I would like to thank, first of all, the foundation and the faculty, well, the school, uh, for having invited the Civil Guard and the National Police Force to this event to participate in this conference. And secondly, I must confess that after listening to the great exhibition, exposition by a the civil guard, I may ask myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Because the, the point of view of the bomb diffusing uh, units in the police force, the perspective with which we work, and we deal with these elements or bombs is uh, an operational perspective. For us, the bombs that have been dormant for 80, 85 years, uh, they've been dormant or buried. They do not have color. They have characteristics. We don't care whether they come from one side or the other. They're just bombs whose who serve a dual purpose. When you create a bomb, there's two reasons for that. One is to kill, and the other one is to destroy. And they could be, you may want to kill and destroy, kill and not destroy, or just destroy. And that is the goal, since they were put there or launched until they explode. So that is the concept with which we work. And then also, in order to close the circle, there's the difficulties that I knew I had to uh, talk just before lunch, and that I just had to complement uh, the presentation by the Civil Guard. So there are many things that have already been mentioned. We treat weapons, uh, bombs in the same way, and many of the things that we can tell you is exactly what my colleague has said. So bearing in mind that I don't have a lot of time, I, th I think I'm not going to say what I was going to say. And normally, when you leave the script, we leave the script out. That leads to disaster. But hey, I'm risky, and I'm going to try and not do what I was going to do because I don't want to be repetitive. And I'm going to focus on things that are slightly bit different, since we know each other not personally, even though we do know each other personally, but also from an institution he's been working for 25 years. I've been working for 30, so we've worked together many times, and I know the presentations he t they tend to do and the ones I tend to do. So we try to differentiate them, um, separate them. Oh. The National Police Force, given that they were going to bring many statistics, I tried to simplify them. The National Police Force has been dealing with this problem since 1975, which is when the um, explosive unit in uh, the National Police Force was created. This. Uh, to the NBRQs, the NBRQs were led, was uh, joined in 2005 to our unit. So since 2005, we have all these problems and all these types of bombs to deal with. Clearly, since 1975, well, till now, or rather, since 1975 till the 80s, sorry, everything was done by the army, the artillery unit in the army. But since it coincided with the terrorists, mainly the ETA terrorist group, they started looking into the possibility that for certain bombs or missiles coming from the civil war times, it was better to be uh, manipulated by, well, they thought that maybe uh, the terrorists could reuse them, and they were not ready for that. They were ready to work with the high caliber munition, whereas we are ready to work with artisanal or hand man-made or oh, artisanal sorry uh, bombs and there was a time when we had to do some training and at the end of the 90s 
all the incidents of this of the kind within the national police force were done by us and also there is the management of statistics that we've historically led other police forces so we've been it's been a bit of a disaster because of how it was we uh, don't have statistics from the 1980s because we don't have it we have a lot of different archives with lots of different information i want to find we need to go to a specific piece of paper look bring it out and read it so we haven't done that because that requires quite a lot of work and uh, we have statistics from 1985 or so that are more reliable. Between 75 and 95, well, I have it somewhere. In total, 1,800 and some interventions due to uh, bombs coming from the Civil War. From 1975 to 1995. From 1995 to now, we do have all the calculations. And we there are very few months in which we've had less than 200 interventions for this type of bombs from the Spanish Civil War. In total, 7,000 and so interventions. With a peculiarity, we uh, count them by unit. It doesn't mean that one intervention is one unit, or one use, one missile, one bomb. There were some incidents where we've had over 100 bombs or 100 missiles. Uh, or in some of them, we've had 100 or 200. So those 8,000 interventions can be uh, actually uh, talking about 10,000 uh, devices, really, high caliber devices. Here, I got it right, and I brought to you a picture. Well, this is just a summary. These are not all the bombs. I've just tried to collect in three slides the types of bombs that could be used in the Civil War. There are more, and especially um, uh, for fuse uh, bombs. Uh, since 1912 to 1913, they were used from then until 1936, 39. So here on the national territory in our stocks, we have all these types of weapons. I'm not talking about figures. I'm talking here about types of weapons, types of ammunition, basically. So we have French bombs, English bombs, manufactured in Spain, manufactured in Germany, and other types of bombs, even chemical weapons. We had had some war conflicts also before in Africa, etc. And there was ammunition coming from there. But there's one peculiarity. Because the, according to our data, well, we know that in the first months of the conflict of the Spanish Civil War, well, in the first three months, let's say, all this ammunition that you can see in our repositories ended. They ran out for both sides. So what do they bring in after that? Well, based on whatever allies they had at the time, some were importing them, importing French bombs, Russian bombs, others German bombs, Italian bombs, etc. And to all of this, we add that bombs, when they ran out, the ones that they had, they started to use whatever they had. So hand grenades, because they didn't have any more aircraft bombs, and they th threw down the um, grenades in one of the sites that one of the in one of the fronts for instance in one of the battles they were using watermelons because they were doing it from very low height and they wanted to intimidate the opposing side so they saw round things coming down from a plane and very dark and they thought it was a bomb uh, whereas they were Watermelons. Anyway, just so you know to what extent there was a lack, scarcity at some point. And that also leads to the difficulty on the different types of elements that we find underground, under the rivers, under us, or even in coastal areas, uh, even though those are uh, carried out by the civil guards, even though the National Police Force also has competence in some of them. So the variety of all this uh, weaponry really leads to problems. 
They use specific uh, missiles to use them in other areas, for instance. They use hand grenades, but there was some artillery ammunition that was reconverted, reconverted into aviation uh, bombs. They changed the fuse bomb, the fuser, and they added another kind of stabilization material. So nowadays we can find them uh, in a missile. We can find a bomb with spreading uh, activities and with uh, a fuse as well. And they came from a plane. Uh, maybe the weapon is uh, of national origin, but the fuse is uh, French, maybe, or the, a French patent or a German patent. Why? Because there was an engineer, and there were many, who reproduced fuses because they didn't have them. So they replicated the fuses that they had seen or for which they had obtained the blueprints. So that also makes it difficult for us to identify those weapons. And if to that we add that all the national police forces work on this, when we try, when we work with explosives, we have to balance out the risk and what we may obtain from the device. So if what we can obtain the risk, well, basically we aim to destroy it without running any risks because it's not worth it. If I see a strange missile, why am I going to try and save it when, if we are not going to investigate a, a killing there? And if we had, we'll, the process will be different. But normally, we just explode them. So as the civil guard said, we destroy them. Total dest destruction of the device. Our peculiarity is that we work in urban areas and sometimes highly dense. And what does that mean? That many times we can't just explode them. We have to remove the device. And in whatever condition it is after 80 years, 85 years, and we have to remove it, take it somewhere else where we can uh, explode it. It's not that we always want to explode them, but the result is always the same. Because if we, even if we want to diffuse them, or do a low degree diffusion, which uh, I don't know how they say in English, but anyway, uh, we want to create a partial explosion to break the body of the of the bomb. We try to do it without fully exploding the bomb. Uh, bearing in mind all the time that has gone by, sometimes inside the bomb, uh, what we have is not originally what we were supposed to be, because mm, well when they had no ammunition, they collected ammunition that had already been used and that hadn't exploded, but that was partly broken or whatever, and they emptied it out, and they filled it up with what they could. And it turns out that that missile had TNT, Trillitum, or whatever. So we find all kinds of devices. And from the pre-war, there was already quite a lot of variety from then. In the Republican side, you can see all the bombs that they started receiving from abroad, plus the ones that they obtained from the warehouse they had. And that's a huge variety there, too. And from the Franco's uh, side, the same, the same. Interesting things. Anecdotes. In the operational sense of the bomb, not the strategic study, okay, of conflict, the operational issues, what could they learn from it? Interesting things, for instance, they could take some fuses. Oh, I can't find it now. Anyway, the router, which is the type, the name of the fuse, uh, the router fuse, I can say there are some colleagues who are geeks about this. They work with the children of uh, routed to see if they understood why they put in, and I'm 
why they put a specific name. They put a very um, interesting names to the different devices. And the children didn't know why. They said, why did your father call this like this? They didn't know. It. So this man, rather, um, developed an acid fuse that was copied. We are sure that it, the Americans took this copied this idea and a few years ago uh, there was uh, several uh, officers who died from a uh, weapon in Germany and we think it's because it was uh, from the American side and they think it was because um, it was that kind of technique so like a little bubble will burst when it was moved and the bubble had a specific acid and it, would, it was mixed with celluloid. And when it came to the end, it led to the explosion of that primary device that led to the explosion of the full bomb. But it was unexpected. It could take 30 minutes. It could take uh, two and a half hours or seven hours or even 12 hours, which they didn't know how long it was going to take. This was good. Why? Because the bombings here, normally they were used for fighter jets, not bombers, because they didn't have so many bomber aircraft. So a fighter jet's at very low height. So if the missile hit, if the bomb hit and exploded, the plane could be affected because really they were fighting at very low height. You know, also the issue of the watermelons that I was mentioning before. So in order to avoid that, what they did is try and get some fuses that would delay the explosion, but at least seven to ten seconds so the uh, plane could uh, go high again and then explode. And this one was a device and the idea was taken to the US. They applied it during the war, Second World War, and one of the, in one of the diffusing activities in Germany, well, a few years back, they uh, gave it enough waiting time they found the type of these bombs, but when they were about to lift it, because I think it was about 500 kilograms, 500 kilogram bomb, when they're about to lift it, you see in machinery, it exploded. Fortunately, they had already a security perimeter, but they got killed uh, or got affected. Just the police officers. So obviously, over for fire bombs, uh, for instance, what they did is they had a squadron. I'm really bad at memorizing names, but I have the name here somewhere. And they said, well, we do not have fire bombs or incendiary bombs. So what did they did? They took uh, aviation bombs of three and a half kilograms of weight. The content of those bombs, well, basically, normally they are 50%. So if the bomb is five kilograms, then in total the explosive inside is two and a half, basically half. It's more or less. So if it's 500 kilograms, then it has about 260 kilograms of explosives, etc. In Spain, we don't think uh, that over bombs over 500 kilograms were used. Well, because we haven't found them. There are some studies that say yes, but obviously you never know to what extent the reliability is, obviously. And the National Police Force, in fact, the biggest bomb, the biggest size bomb he has found was 100 kilograms. We haven't had above 100 kilograms. And in this occasion, as I was saying, with two uh, personal bombs, they decided to take it to the auxiliary uh, um, area uh, in one of the planes and put it there and then go to the area that they wanted to bomb with these incendiary bombs and they called it the devil's egg because we love naming things here in this country. And I think I've spoken a lot. Anyway, I would like to launch the idea of whether if, I mean, a colleague from the Civil Guard has already said it, but there's also the idea that it's not 
uh, it's not worthwhile to become the last victim of the Spanish Civil War. The last victim of the Spanish Civil War hasn't happened yet. Why? Because there's still an unquantifiable number of devices. We don't know how many aviation bombs, there are not that many left, because normally they were highly reliable, and they most of them exploded. And we think that they also had certain control over the ones that they s dropped. So the side who, if they managed to get the other ones to flee, the other side to flee to occupy a territory, then the ones on the aircraft, the large bombs, especially at the beginning, they could have one or two large bombs, not more. They could have 80 or three and a half kilograms, but of 250 kilograms, they could only carry two. So if one didn't diffuse, they remembered. Okay, one has not diffused in Ocaña. So then as they advanced, they would look for it. Another note I have here for you is just so you imagine how difficult it is to quantify. The number. So, the War Material Recovery Services until 1942 had collected and destroyed 1,333,910 hand grenades, 196,856 artillery missiles, and 3,315 mines. Just in 1942, okay, the ones that had been taken. So, imagine the ones that did not explode. So obviously there were many more, uh, but it's impossible to calculate. So from the National Police Force, we'd like to say that no one deserves becoming the last victim of the Spanish Civil War. And we need to foster the process of delivery, uh, but also the reporting these devices that are still hidden or buried in shelves in uh, the are used as ornaments in attics something and suddenly you inherit a house and you find them and because you are fearful of that administrative process you say well i'm gonna say that my dad had a bomb here uh, they don't want to say it. they don't want to do the administrative process and maybe that's in the bin because they don't want to call the spanish uh, the police forces but they should they're not going to be considered criminals it's not considered uh, normal to have an explosive at home. But if you have it, you may as well just report it in order to make the process easier. Nothing's going to happen, OK? The police force will just come in. So please don't, don't just put them in the bin. I hope I've uh, met your demands. And I'm really sorry I've uh, gone for too long. And I hope I wasn't too boring. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco Javier. I would just like to, your, your presentation here was very, very interesting. Very interesting. And also, you, in this, given where we are, well, I was, I kept two important lessons. First, I think you talked about 30,000 incidents, and you also spoke about uh, a lot. So, I did use, I did ask, sorry, that the, there are other priorities within the Spanish police forces, but for the historians and experts on documentation here gathered, it will be great if that information can be kept safe. So we'll have to work with both forces in the future so that those documents can be used for new studies and to shed more light on that sense. Well, it's there at your disposal. But you will have to work with it, not us. Yes, of course. You know, we have all those papers that you can use. Obviously, you can use them, but you'll have to work with them, not us. We don't have time to that. And it's not in order. And, you know, it's all a bit of a, it requires a lot of work, manual work. OK, well, thank you very much. We're going to take a break now for lunch. They are telling me to please do not leave anything in the room because the doors cannot be locked, okay? Because everything's got cabling for the streaming. So please take your things with you, take your personal belongings with you. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. We come back to the program of the conference. In this case, we're just going to have on the screen the directors of the documentary that we're going to see, Rafa Molest and Pepe Andreo. They are in the festival in Cracovia presenting another documentary, and that's why they can be here physically with us today. They told me that they were already in the hotel room waiting for the connection. I would like to see them on the screen so that they can hear me. And I'm just going to tell you briefly what the documentary is about. So some of the things that have happened or that you're going to see in this documentary I have already been talked about in this conference. I don't know if you can hear me or see me. Yes, we can hear you now. How is it going in Cracovia? I hope it's going well. Yes, there is a documentary festival, which is probably the oldest one in the world, the 75th edition. It's very interesting. The atmosphere is wonderful. And it's a very strange uh, feeling to be in the streets here. So before the connection, I was telling everyone here that we are very happy to have you even if it's not physically, and that you were able to organize everything so that within the festival you had time for us. And our conference, we really want to see your, we're eager to see your documentary. We have uh, already said that you're the authors of the documentary. The Stuka experiment uh, is um, trying to shed some light of what happened in these little four towns. And they saw some planes in the horizon and no one knew what was going to happen. We had an intuition, have an intuition about what happened after. Uh, but we have a lot of questions that I hope the documentary can answer, or probably uh, we're going to have a few more questions after it. But anyway, I would like to give the floor to you so that you can present the documentary. And after seeing it, uh, we'll see you again. So just to let you know that people that are following us through social media can uh, ask their questions for the directors through a WhatsApp message uh, in the phone that you're going to see in the on the screen. So without further ado, I give the floor to you. And once again, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for inviting us. The documentary starts uh, where we get the story of what happened in this small town in Castellón. We have just done our first documentary, and someone from the University of Jaume Premier, a colleague, told us about this story. And we were thinking, like everyone, how come that this happened? But we never have done historic movies. We didn't know how to face this project, but then we met Oscar and we closed the story. What we were interested was the connection about this history that have already been studied, but that didn't reach the people in the town. And in the town, Oscar and the group of the recuperation of the historic uh, memory brought the story to us. We always work with human stories. We didn't think about a historic documentary. We're not historians. I studied our history, and we know the science of history and how history works. But what we were interested on was the proximity, how close it was to us. I had a personal connection with Benasal, which is the town where everything happened. I used to spend my holidays there. And what attracted us was that the protagonists of this story were alive, and they were very old. And from the beginning, we were aware of something that happened had already been told 
by Anthony Bieber, published in his book in 2005. But as Pepe was saying, this story that existed, that was in the books, was not connected to, to their protagonist. And this was symbolic not only of what happened there, but also what has happened in the transition, in the Spanish transition that is never ending. So when we got to the town the first time, we met a silence that had been there for 80 years. And the first thing we did was this. We knew that there was something unknown to us. The data that we have were the research that had been done by the neighbors and through this historic memory project. And the first thing we did was to record all the witness testimonies. And this was a source that we were going to run out of. And if there were other sources, it was not our job. We didn't want to investigate the story. We wanted to see how someone who was tired of asking questions and facing silence decided to give an answer to those questions. And we thought that the sociological and human point of view motivated us to film this documentary. So we put all the, their accounts together, and we saw that the story was summarized. And it's the same story of a, on other thousand towns in Spain. We knew that there was a report from the Condor Legion that was in the archives of Friburgo, and they, they talk about Venasa and Oscar Vives and the group for the historic memory. They see themselves with three other towns with a similar story, but they haven't really spoken about it. The families haven't spoken about it. The neighbors haven't been talking about it. And this is the starting point for us, the focus for us, to get the accounts of the protagonist. You're going to see a documentary where, unfortunately, most of the people that you're going to get to know in this film are not alive anymore. I would say about 99% are not alive anymore. And we can see their work, how they ask themselves questions, how they meet in this historic memory group. There are various historians there, they are neighbors, they are teachers, and they ask themselves questions. And after these questions, they realize that there are so uh, sources, historical sources and archives that hold the answer to these questions. And this is the story of their town. And this is the research that we do. We don't investigate what happened. We explain how to the contrary of what we normally do, what has happened in our house in the recent years and why don't we talk about it, they decided to stop this taboo, to break the taboo and take a step by step. They use their own resources, they travel to Germany, a step forward individually and collectively and connecting with that history and connecting with the historians that have worked on that, that have published um, media on that. It was very symbolic, very surreal, maybe surreal, but very, very important, especially in a rural uh, environment like Castellón is. So they describe a bit of the personality using a metaphor that we thought it was beautiful and how they are, they are close people, then they know, all, everyone knows each other, they are scared to talk to each other, and you need to understand the context. So how did come they didn't know about this? Anthony Bieber had published about it in 2005, they knew it. And we need to get into this rural universe, which is really extended in Spain. So there, the research is theirs, and the investigation is going to continue, and it has contaminated the nearby towns. 
we focus on the story of our protagonists, but there have been new groups of the recovery of historic memory and all these towns were involved during the process. And this is the starting point for us as filmmakers and this human side of the story. And a specific fact that happened here and that belongs to another layer of the story that we wanted to portray was the feeling of connecting the Junkers 87A that participated in these bombings, known as Stuka, this was the name they were known by, had a very peculiar way of bombarding and it reminded us of the way to kill the most efficient way, blindly, not knowing what you had in front of you. And uh, there was a premise that acted as a starting point. There was not a historical premise, but more a humanist premise. We thought killing someone is not easy unless all the world mechanism, all the world language, everything that surrounds were looking at the different sceneries make killing easy. And this connected us with films where we started filming. Uh, since the beginning of 2014 until the premiere in 2018, we saw something once and again, something that they discover us, something that happened there, they connected current events, current news, things that were happening in Syria with their own lives back then. And so we had the feeling that we had to put this in the film. They told us, they made us see that if we don't talk about it, if we don't write the story, we are going to repeat it. And this idea, in 2014, we were talking a lot about historic memory and the recuperation of the democratic memory in Spain. And we were talking about the people who have been killed. And we we're talking about opening wounds. And we thought that by writing their own story, they were curing these injuries, these scars. We didn't want it to tell it from a historic point of view, but we saw that there was a story that someone started and people joined, and we just were joining them from our point of view as filmmakers, and we just uh, saw the accounts, and we were talking about with all the survivors, and that's how the film came to our heads. And then in four years, uh, ideas change, and uh, this story was created. We hope you enjoy it. We have been working on it for years. This uh, event was planned ahead, and uh, we are so happy to finally see you. And this film is from 2018. We have done other films afterwards, and maybe we talk about it after we see it. Thank you so much. So if you don't want to add anything else, I wanted to see it beforehand, but now I want to. I really want to see it. Um, I'm not going to say anything else. So we will connect again when the documentary is over. Yeah, we'll see you later. Thank you so much. OK, bye. Now we're just going to see the documentary. Thank you. So we've just seen the documentary Project Stuka, and we're going to connect once again with the directors of this documentary film, uh, Pepe uh, Andreu, Rafael Mores. Pepe, I'm sure he's about to appear on our screen. I don't know what you think about the documentary. I still feel a bit in shock. And as soon as, as soon as we have 
are connected uh, with them again, then if any of you have any questions for them, we can take a microphone to you and you can ask them the question. I have 300 questions to ask them. Let's just wait a sec. Okay. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, we can. I feel in shock. I'm really touched after watching your film. I'm very emotional. I don't know if you normally you feel the reaction in the audience. And I don't know, it's something that was very pretty that and beautiful, that end. But also I feel overwhelmed. I was watching the film and I'm really sorry. I was always thinking about the banality of evil by Herai and that effectivity and in the use of weapons. So I'm sorry for this brief introduction. Uh, now I'm going to give you the floor in case uh, there is something you would like to comment, first of all, before uh, we give the floor to the audience. We'll try to open up a dialogue because I'm sure there'll be many things uh, to talk about. But um, I don't know. I give you the floor in case you have any comments to make. Well, thank you very much. Now, when you were saying this, I re we remember that. Well, I was remembering the thoughts of the audience in 2018 when we took it to the festivals and we premiered the film. And I think well, people told us the most, or what we found most impacting was when someone raised their hand and asked you, look, I have never spoken to my mom or my dad or my grandfather or grandma. And I think when I go back, I have got a few questions to ask them. And I think that was one of the reactions that we didn't expect, even though maybe, maybe it was the most honest uh, reaction with what, after looking at what we wanted to tell. In the film, you've seen families that were broken because they were broken by silence, by fear, stories that or a history that was changed because of something that happened, not just in this village, but in many others. And they said, you know, they left the churches like this, the, the Reds, when they left, the communists, they left it like this. They don't want anything left behind. And I also remember other stories that are not in the documentary. But for instance, the mayor uh, Franco's uh, mayor of Berasal, if you remember in the first testimonies, they talk about those three girls, the three sisters that died in a bombing. Those three sisters were the three daughters of a neighbor that during Franco's regime was the mayor of La Sal. And he was, he pinpointed people such as the father of Angel Artola, the one who speaks about the father and he said, well, our, we haven't seen this. Our planes don't have the ability to do this. But that man used to point uh, to Artola's father and saying, shut your mouth. Look at what you did with my daughters or to my daughters. And uh, there's a state uh, of confusion and innocence deep down, innocence or naivety, we could say, in many cases. And that was demolishing just Looking at that, in 2016, 17, 18, still that perspective, after looking at the archives and looking at the documents that they had, it was uh, quite incredible to think those stories had happened and those deep stories that we're supposed, we were supposed not to dig into because we were not supposed to bring up any of the emotions, but it was actually the opposite. People needed to talk. After the film, people continued to talk. And they all wanted to turn the page over. They did. They wanted to turn over the page, but they had to write it and read it first. Not just They don't want to just turn the page over. They wanted to write and read because I mean, when we were making the film and people were telling us the stories like Angel Artola, whose father left him this tape. Well, in fact, what he said is, I don't want you to tell you more things. 
And I think that's also an experience that many of us have lived. I don't want you to hate, to tell you more things because I don't want you to hate the, hate the others. And I think that terrible spiral of silence leads us to this vacuum and this disconnection between the work of historians and the protagonists of the, of the film that were alive a long, not that long ago. Some of them are still alive. Something else that people always told us, especially in the education field, was I remember when uh, we, got, we taught history, we would get to the Civil War, and that's when the end of the year came. So those are anecdotes that, in the end, have devastating effects in society. And I think that's what we wanted to explain in the film. And then those things that you find, you know, when we look at the amount of hours that we spend with these elderly people in their homes, and they have the TV on, and then suddenly we saw images of Aleppo. And they said, look, this is exactly what I was trying to explain to you. And you see the, rum, you know, the remains of builders, the, all the rubble, and they think, well, and then when you see the images of the drones, shooting from that distance, not even with a pilot on board. Soldiers that are shooting from a base in London, a plane that takes off from whatever. I don't know, that distance is there. You need that distance to kill, I guess. And that's also a story we would rather not know. I think it's all about I mean, and this has, links with the idea of transition of that part of the story. The less we know, the easier it is to hate someone. When you get to know other people and they tell you their stories, it's very difficult to hate others uh, as humans. But sometimes uh, to hate you need that disconnection, that disconnection that's used as a tactic so that soldiers can, in fact, go to the front line and execute orders. As a society, that also exists. It's just based on the lack of knowledge, of not answering questions, not asking even questions. And that means that in the end, all those wounds are open, and we all want to close them. Yeah, something else, after looking at it, after watching it again, uh, what was, you know, the thing about Alberto and, and with this beautiful music called Scar, and then there is a silence, and then the questions come up. Thank you. First is, is uh, thanks. Thank you for doing this. When Thank you for telling me this. When I go home, I'm going to ask what happened in my family. And many people also raised the hand and said, my village was also bombed. Do you know anything about my village? And we said, well, we're not historians. We urge you to tell the stories. The stories are out there. And you can also be protagonists. You can also ask these questions like Oscar does in the film and obtain the answers that I'm sure you still have. Yeah, in that sense, I think that there are questions, as I said. I mean, questions have come up, and I think that's very interesting. I mean, in this topic, we found that there was not a lack of answers on the table. There was a lack of questions. We found it quite symbolic uh, to see this in the reality. It was not about answers, not, not having answers. It's about not having questions. and. It's great to be able to pose the questions. Well, I'm going to give now the floor to the audience. I'm not sure whether there are any questions. There's one at the back. At the back, please. Hi, can you hear me? OK. What I wanted to know was, apart from everyone in the village that were ready to open up and tell their testimony, were there other people who did not want to talk or people who were upset about the documentary being made? Did you also see that other side? No. The truth is not ever. 
I think our presence or our idea with the documentary was just to accompany what they were doing. I mean, we didn't get there to explain a story or investigate story. We were there to accompany that neighborhood story, the human story, and it was quite the opposite. It's true that the documentary is just a little piece that adds to that work that was done. A film of 79 minutes length has a value as a documentary, but and we were aware of this, that it, it does have the strength of the images and the strength of stirring up things, we could say. But I think people quite the opposite. When they saw the cameras, they were coming in, they were asking, maybe they had heard also from other neighbors that they were invest, you know, be, this was being researched, but there was uh, an engine that had started, uh, there was the drive there, and people were always willing to tell us their stories. They called us, like in this case, you know, of Antonio, the man who lives in Barcelona. That came to us during the shooting of the film, because in fact, Journalists asked us, and there was some news about the fact that we were film, shooting the film, and they called us up. So people came to us on purpose to try and tell their story and to, and then realize that actually quite the opposite of what they thought. They thought that their parents had sent them over to this village, which for him was for him was hell. Uh, he always thought that they had tried to get rid of him. And through this, he realized, not because of us, but because he spoke to his neighbors, and he realized that it, that wasn't the case, that it was a case, it was a, city, a place where nothing was supposed to happen, that the parents chose him amongst his siblings, so that if uh, Barcelona was going to be hit, because it, within the war process it was delicate, Basically, they just wanted to make, they sent him over somewhere where they thought he was going to be safe. So he reconciled with his family. And then in the archives, I mean, people always asked us access about access to archives. I think the access to archives was very straightforward, very simple. It's true that after shooting the film, the documentary, then there was a time when the archive in Avila was uh, closed down for a while and then reopened. But it was very easy to go to the archives. And for us, as observers of the story, we found that this was very interesting. We were not aware that that was there, and that you could go to the archive, and you could just find it and read it. And you could go to look for information about your village, and you could find it. And this was done through someone, through a neighbor who went to ask. And it turns out that there are a lot of elements that we can have access to. But I don't know. Maybe we haven't incentivized ourselves to go there. I know there are many historians doing it, but uh, it was historians doing it in parallel, in parallel to the public opinion, in parallel to the civil society. So it was quite the opposite. It was very easy to accompany these people in their personal search or quest. I'm really sorry, I can't hear the question. Okay. Oh, there's a question from someone with, from, he says, I'm Andreas, I'm investigating about a second degree uncle who on the 29th of May, 1938, died near Algocaser on board of a Heikel 111. I've read the Condor Legion uh, reports and they said there was always anti-air enemy, um, enemy anti-air control. So I don't know, how do you explain that from Germany? Oh, well, I, I, um, it's very interesting that that person is also trying to find answers for a relative. We are not historians. We are unaware of the history. We will need more context. As we explained in the documentary, we were at the front. These were the villages, the ones, the first villages of the Republican side. And Alsenia has always been considered one more village, you know, just one side or the other, as it happened on the wall. 
he was the front lines. And the mountains in Belazar, for instance, is 60 kilometers or 30 kilometers. If you need to know the terrain of Berasal to know that 30 kilometers is not like going from Madrid to somewhere in the outskirts of Madrid. Those 30 kilometers are up and down, and the war was taking place there. Also, we spoken later on, a couple of years later, we spoke to someone who at the time uh, there was a Republican in the army, and he told us that they were trying to fix the weapons of the soldiers of the Republic and that they exploded. And uh, this gunsmith explained uh, also as the great battle of the Republican front because there was a lot of resistance there. But there was uh, this gunsmith that was fixing rifles and he spoke about tragic uh, stories like only one rifle per every two soldiers. So we have to cross the stories. There are the war logs, there are, uh, those war logs, in fact, are the beginning of propaganda. So you always have to be careful about them because in the war logs is when you try to, is where you try to write history. But then there's the other testimonies and the written testimonies and oral testimonies that have uh, the remembrance, but also distance from those memories. So I encourage that person, as all others, to ask to go to the area. There are many new groups of uh, historic uh, recovery and historic memory out there working. But about war details, I am afraid we can't give any information. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Miguel Sánchez. I am a teacher at the University of Rey Juan Carlos. And for three or four years, we've been collaborating with the Foundation for the Recovery and Protection of uh, Peroncelli. I don't know if you've heard about Robert Gapper's picture. First, I would like, first of all, I would like to thank you and congratulate you for the documentary and how you've made something so interesting as uh, those aseptic uh, first attacks, especially for those who were bombarded. And also, I would like to know your opinion on Perancelli. I was uh, surprised at how still people have told us that it was the first time that they were talking about what happened in the war when we interviewed people in Vallecas. And also that idea, the fact that the grandchildren, it was the first time that grandchildren were asking uh, grandparents about it. And there was that a specific way of uh, the war. It was like that. It was like bombing from very far. And how there, there was that mediation through the screens, and that kind of disconnection from reality. And I think that looking at your documentary, watching your documentary, I thought that this, uh, this is something, there's some history that the pandemic has taken away from us. Now we are in a situation in which Spain, we have 80,000, 100,000 deaths due to the pandemic. And somehow it was as aseptic as those bombings. I mean, we've had 100,000 deaths. This is not a war, but we have had 100,000 deaths. And some of them are the last witnesses of that war. So I just wanted to, to just talk about that. COVID has put an end, we could say, to those last witnesses of a war that we were, that people were starting to talk about again. And we have lost uh, that opportunity, I think, due to the pandemic. And I think, at least in a documentary such as that, uh, such as yours, we'll have a testimony of that war. Yes. In fact, uh, the, that's what these uh, memory groups were doing. Those villages have that attitude to try and recover memory from interviews, from oral testimonies. Because, you know, otherwise this all will be lost and there has to be a testimony of this. Yes, and I agree. I think we had uh, also made that reflection. Most of the of the people that participated in our documentary died before the pandemic because they were very old. But I remember the time we made that reflection, we shared that with many people. Not only that, not only those testimonies 
Oh, witnesses that will are nearly around, there are around 90 that soon may uh, pass away. At the time, for instance, Angeles, the man in black, uh, they were like men dressed in black. He was about 15, nearly 16, and he had a very good, he had a, quite an, an adult memory or because he was nearly, well, he was a teenager of that, had a memory of that Spain. And he went to work, I remember, and he made us think about the fact that we are recovering the memory well, or the group of historic uh, memory and us recording them or shooting them. We were, in fact, just uh, trying to preserve the memories of children and teenagers. That made us think of how many adults, young adults, men, women, with a vivid memory, with a more mature point of view, we had lost. Because if the ones alive were the ones that were children at the time, and that was in 2014, 2015, 2016, they were explaining their memories, their remembrances, and it's true that um, they said that sometimes uh, memories have to be put in inverted commas. Um, so imagine if we had people 40, 50 who were there at the time and we never heard their story. They could have told us in a more adult uh, fashion their story. Maybe there were meetings in the villages with details. Also, there's women of 30 that um, recovered uh, injured soldiers that were in the hostel and that could have given us a more comprehensive view of those events. We lost all that. And yes, what happened is we took a long time to get these accounts. There is a lot of people working, as you historians know, in the oral memory, but our feeling was that it took us a long time as a society, not just as filmmakers, to start asking ourselves questions, and we lost very valuable accounts of uh, bigger quality because they probably knew better what happened then. We listened to young people and children, but the film has these things of looking at them when they narrate something that is so vivid in their heads. We have lost so many people now with our pandemic. Also, we have lost a, a number of accounts before because we didn't ask ourselves the questions. I don't know if anyone else would like to ask something or some other questions that they ask through the social media, no more. So, just out of interest, I don't know, the documentary has a structure and planning, but you had the testimony of uh, these um, old men in Barcelona. Did you change as you went along? Did you know the conclusion before filming? Or did this unveil as you went along? I mean, to try and understand what happened. Yes, when we started, what we know is that Oscar, Oscar Vives told us, I found re reading this book by Anthony Giver. I was, he was looking for the name of his town. He was looking for it anywhere he could. And he found this Anthony Beaver quote that talks about this archive from the Condor Legion and links this to a way of documenting all these experiments and trials in so many territories that the Condor Legion had done. They took advantage of the situation in Spain. I think Stephanie was talking about this. They realized that apart from the economic interest on the of the Hitler's Germany, they wanted to turn Spain as a free-for-all. And 
They said to themselves, once we are there, let's try this and that. So we went to London to talk to Anthony Givers, and also we counted on Oscar and everyone else to gather all the information to go to the archives. We also went to the archives. We went there. We gathered all this information. But the conclusion, etc. And there were other details that were added to the story. And we started to have this story of the war. But the human stories were changing. The, obviously, the story was written from the beginning because we knew that there were some neighbors that had done something that we normally didn't do. And it was to look at the past and to ask themselves the questions that no one did ask. And they didn't complain at the bar and went home and did nothing. They tried to answer them. So in this way, we knew what the end of the story was. This was the end of our story the end of the story that we were looking for to document a ex clear example of someone taking a step that we don't normally take. And also the historic fact, they were narrating it, and we only explained their own conclusions. But the story changed as we went along, because their own research and our own filmmaking was adding the different accounts. Angel Artola was, talk, was talking about his dad and was listening to this tape. And he listened to the tape and was putting two and two together. And this changed the structure. So at the beginning, we thought that we had the accounts that we wanted to rescue and keep for the movie. And then this work, little by little, we realized that we could access the archives, that there were documents. So that was the final message. It's possible to get to know everything. And when we found these accounts and the new, new witnesses and Mercedes, she lives in Germany near Freiburg. And she was talking about her parents. And we added it this intentional misunderstanding, ignore misunderstanding, or innocent even misunderstanding. And this is what changed the structure. It was not just go along side by side with them, but also the structure made visible the research in terms of their social life, their families, etc. These people did something that we're not used to do. And we knew from the beginning that there were elements for this something to be brought to life. It was not something impossible. We knew that the documents were there. We had to go and find them and revise, review them. And we thought that we will learn from them would be that if we all pushed together, if we read the historians and we linked all the stories, we thought that the end of the movie could be inspirational as it happened. But getting to know the end of the war elements, apart from the war elements, you know, apart from the plane being this and that, etc., this is not a thesis, this is a film. For us, the war was just an anecdote. We were looking at the motivation, the fact that there's the story was special, the fact that there was this archive. They were even more motivated when they found it, but the spirit of Pili, Raul, and Oscar Vives was there. That was special. But the, what was special about their story was that was a, there was a lot of motivation, and we just added that together, adding energy to the research. But we were aware, we were talking to Stephanie or, and Anthony, and we were listening to them. And we knew that there were experiments in Asturias, I think, in with this Napalm prototype that we see in the memories and letters of Gollum. But the experimentation of the Condor Legion in Spain 
was one of the missions that they had almost from the start. To know the end of the story, just to summarize, was not as important. We knew new things about this story as we went along, but it was not the important thing for us. We, we knew the plot, but what we wanted to tell was the accounts to have Antonio and Merce to look at this story of scars and silence. This is where the film lays. Because of the war details, is for historians, and we need to be very responsible when it comes to that, all of us. Yeah, I completely agree. So, but the end, all the researchers knew that it was maybe the Germans, but there was a reconciliation attached to it beyond getting it known in certain spheres. The towns they didn't know the truth, they didn't have that reconciliation. So this end really shakes me to the core. It's like when they burn the tree in the square. It's like burning the past and come back to life from your ashes. So things get mended and both sides liberate themselves from their burden of the civil war. Maybe it wasn't the goal of the project, but it shakes me to the core. Not only within the town, but within the Mercedes family, for example, they understand and overcome this once they know the story. And the two sides that you were mentioning, uh, we didn't know, think that this work will divide more. We were a bit naive when it came to that because we had the feeling at the beginning that the town was uh, getting united. They were reconnecting. So we treated La Senia as the fifth town of the story because La Senia is on the other side and the airfield was built by Russian military. And I think a few months, a few weeks after, the Condor Legion come in. And so the fact that from the Senia, they attack Venezuela from the Senia. Senia is in Tarragona, is in the border, but there is there a, a union with different towns from Aragon, Castellón, and Tarragona. There is a community there. They speak the same language with the same accent. The towns are more or less the same, and suddenly, some of the towns had the German officials in their homes, and from their own homes, they were bombarding their own friends and neighbors. Yeah. So this indiscrimination from the different sides that people witness and that some people participated on, he was curious to see. So in the Senia, they felt like the bad ones because in the when we talk about war, we all always talk about the good and the bad. It was for us interesting to explain what the relationship with the Germans were. We know that there are planes that leave sometimes and they arrive or get back, and sometimes they're very happy, sometimes they're very sad. But they survived the war, and as Oscar and everyone said, Stephanie and Anthony, Bieber, and everyone else says, don't forget that the Condor Legion was here, fighting, because they called them. We shouldn't simplify that we had these sites. The Condor Legion was here because they were helping Franco and this 
has been demonstrated and we can't forget about it. There is a last question coming from YouTube. Nacho Gobiera says, according to what you are saying about the disappearance naturally of the protagonist, do you think that the son of grandchildren have, have it, the memory? Or what tools from your field of work can be done to facilitate that we still have those accounts. I think we've lost a lot, especially our generation. We have lost our grandparents, and we haven't spoken about this. The new generations are even more disconnected. But uh, we put into value the people. And I don't know what to do to recover this family life, to keep these memories. I don't think I can have an answer to that. Thank you for the question. The feeling is that we arrived late. We were talking about with the children and young people of the time. And We've lost these 13 or 14 accounts. Imagine how many of them have lost their brothers, their sisters, their uncles and aunts. There is another learning to take from this. And that's why our film, which is a social film, which is the filmmaking that we do, there was something that struck us which was the treatment of the war from just a war perspective, looking just at the military side. We found a lot of literature, and we also found a lot of researchers that investigate just the military. But we think, I personally think, that it is harmful. And it's harmful if we would like to be a society that asks questions and looks for answers. So the majority of people that are there are probably historians or are interested in history, and you like uh, National Geographic, and you like to talk from a warlike point of view, like if it was a war game, and distancing yourselves from the human dimension. And we should think about this. We should reflect on this. We shouldn't separate the different aspects of the story. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense to study story if we don't study history from the human point of view. Why did it happen from the point of view of the victims? And we just describe in some, piece, some literature or or we just approach war as a lot of small battles. You have the feeling that we are not leaving enough, enough room for accounts and the protagonist and the people who went through it. And this is what we've lost. In Spain, we try to do it. But I think we came from the same perspective of silence and fear to speak about the war. If we talk about war just as something technical, contributes to this uh, silence in the story and the reality of the effects of war. And these accounts, the lost accounts and the accounts that are rescued in the documentary, Maybe they wouldn't approach the history that they were living. So it was like war was something technical. You speak about kilograms of bombs, etc. If we just talk about that, we don't connect to the history, even though we are protagonists, and maybe we don't demand. And from the historians, and we don't help the historians to do their work. And so everyone comes from a demand. And if there is no demand 
to know, to ask yourself questions. If you get away from the history, you don't help historians with their work, and you don't help them to continue researching and connecting different stories. This distance between explaining a war just from a technical or war-like point of view makes you feel as a protagonist or someone who went through it, maybe you don't feel part of the narration of that war because it's only been told from a military point of view and almost as if nothing had happened. So from an unconscious pilot, they just see ants under. So if we don't put a face to each of these ants, then you don't feel part of this story, and you think that your story is not important, because what they were t telling about your story were other things. So some people didn't think that what they lived through was important, because it was not important. Or people didn't find it important. And to look at this social and human dimension within the world is going to help us to be more aware and everyone is going to feel more like participating in creating our history as a society. This probably will help in other situations, like now that with the pandemic, that we can get more involved. We should get involved in the story. And sometimes when we talk about war, history has forgotten people with some ex exceptions, of course, but maybe you don't feel that you're part of the history. There is one last question, and this is uh, the last one is an observation from Gianluca Fiocco, a researcher from the University of Rome. He congratulates you from, for your work. And he has the impression that at work they have experimented with the weapons, the same as the US bombings on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where were not really needed and was a way of experimenting for them. Yes, it's true. The war is the perfect playground to experiment. And it's not just purely exper experimenting, as we were explaining in the documentary. It's good to have these tactical trials or these weapon trials. It's good to do them close to the front, because then we're going to be able to um, get to that town and to study it. So all experiments are part of a war. But uh, like is seen clearly in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was not really needed. And to explain this just purely on a war level is not enough. So having spoken to historians, they have said that they help you winning the war. It has a logic or military logic behind it, but obviously for some, in this case the Condor Legion, serves to prepare other wars. Great. Gianluca Fioco was also asking if there is a version with subtitles in English or in dubbed in Spanish, in English, sorry. Yes, there is a version in English. The film was in filming for a long time, but international platforms, I don't think we have it, but you can send us a, an email. And we can maybe send you a copy. There is a, a that, uh, copy with English subtitles that we use in festivals. We have it in the film festival in Germany. You can send us an email to you, and we can try and help him in this regard. So thank you so much for your documentary and for your time, the time that you have dedicated to us so kindly. And good luck in Krakow 
with your new project and with your future projects. Thank you so much, because this is part of the same logic. Each of us add up. We have done it from the film angle and you with this conference in the end. We add up to understand the reality that worries us or concerns us better. Thank you so much, and I wish you luck. So this is the end of today's session, and tomorrow we will see each other here at 10 o'clock. And thank you so much for to all of you for being here today with us.